This story takes place in a world not unlike our own, in a land called Terranor. According to the prophecy, a super-being was supposed to appear from another world when the Emperor's heart was burned. Ruler Luslanad sacrificed many of his children and cronies to fulfill this prophecy. When the sacrifice was made, an earthly child appeared before the Emperor. The Emperor was enraged, seeing a ten-year-old boy in front of him instead of a powerful creature whose control would have given incredible power. The boy did not understand where he was. He was confused and frightened. But the Emperor did not care about him and ordered to take the child out of sight. Newly summoned to another world, Laxland Palace was shaken by blows of unprecedented force. Its walls and ceiling were covered with cracks and bloodstains of people and monsters. Emperor Lustlanad summoned a powerful new creature to his world out of his last strength to protect himself from an unrelenting threat. A giant serpent with spikes around its head and fangs the size of a human leg wriggled in the center of the hall, obscuring Lustlanad from the approaching knight. Not a single muscle on the knight's face flinched. His cloak billowed into the air and he gripped his sword, preparing to strike. The knight swung and blue discharges danced around him, indicating that he was using some powerful magic. It was the two techniques of conquering heaven and rumbling mountains at once, which dealt the serpent a blow of colossal power, plunging it to the ground and tearing it apart. The emperor realized that he had nothing to counter his attacker as the knight destroyed all the creatures and didn't even pant. The knight walked to the steps in front of the throne and said that the power of the emperor's monsters stemmed from the fact that they were from another world. His face expressed indignation, mixed with impatience to fulfill a long-delayed plan. It turned out to be a young lad who seemed familiar to Lustlanad. The knight decided to give a hint and shouted out that he too was summoned from another world. It was Song Shehan, the unearthly savior. Everything in this hall, both the knight and the monster parts scattered around the hall, were the fruit of the Laxlin family's special ability to open portals to other worlds. Shi Han came closer and closer to the king sitting on the ground, accusing him of tyranny, many deaths, and human suffering. But it was also because of Lustlanad that Shi Han himself suffered, in whom the emperor bitterly recognized the very boy he had neglected. A boy who was thrown into a dungeon for nothing and spent many years there with no hope of any future. The Emperor knew that three years ago, that boy had escaped from the dungeon with the help of a certain mage who had caused great destruction. Shahan confessed that he had been dreaming of revenge every day for years, and now the hour of reckoning had come. The boy's eyes flashed with anger, and he drew his sword, covered in blue discharges, wanting to put all his pain into this blow. The pain of years lost in confinement, the pain of injustice, and the loss of friends who died because of Lustlanad. The emperor only gritted his teeth, feeling that these were his last moments, but there was no remorse in them, only anger. He only had time to cry out as he cursed the prophecy that had failed him so cruelly. At this moment, Shahan's sword slashed Lustlanad's chest, and he collapsed against the wall he was sitting near. The wielder of the powerful gift of summoning beings from other worlds was now dead blood pouring from his mouth, staining his white fur collar. Sheehan looked at the defeated enemy, and a stiff expression remained on his face, as if he couldn't believe that it was really over. He tucked his sword into its scabbard in a familiar motion, getting ready to leave this gloomy place. Guy cast one last glance at the dead emperor and told himself that it was finally over. Finally, Shahan closed his eyes and exhaled in relief, as the fury of the fight slowly began to release him. Just then, he heard footsteps approaching and was called by name by a ringing maiden's voice. The boy turned around with joy and called out to the girl in return, for it was his beloved Levina. Still her face, framed by silver hair, radiated joy and maybe even delight. She approached, waving her hand. She congratulated Shihan on his victory. And at this moment, Lavina, with her silver hair and radiant smile, seemed like the most beautiful being in the world. The boy and the girl approached each other, and Shihan replied to Lavina that this victory was not easy for him. He wrapped his arms around her, pulling her close to him, 
because he needed the warmth of a loved one more than ever. Shihan whispered in his girlfriend's ear that everything would be fine now, and he could finally do everything to make her happy. Lavina pulled away from the guy slightly, and looked him in the eyes and addressed him by name, as if she started to say something, but stopped. A familiar voice sounded behind Shahan's back, saying that there was still one more important thing left to do, for one had to burn the Emperor's heart. It was a magician. He was pleased that Shihan had exceeded his expectations, and that he couldn't believe that Shihan would succeed in such a difficult endeavor. Shihan was surprised to see his comrade Mage Lilstein here right after the beating. But Lilstein was not alone, as the other four of his comrades who had helped him with the plan were just coming up. They reasoned whether Shihan would disappear if they burned the Emperor's heart and that it was ironic that the king, in trying to gain power, had called for his own death. Sheehan was even a little perturbed that they were having such an easy conversation about the fact that he could disappear from this world right now and they wouldn't be able to see him again. At this time, Lavina put her hand on his shoulder and asked him penetratingly if he wasn't anxious to get home to Earth from where he had been ruthlessly kidnapped. Shihan looked at his friends with a smile in return and replied that he had finally decided to stay. He said that all the people closest to him, both living and already dead, are here in this world. Lilstein, who had already started the fire to perform the burning, turned around as he listened to Shihan's speech. The boy added that also in this world was his favorite person, and at these words Lavina's cheeks flushed. Shahan admitted that of course he misses the earth, but this world has already become much more native and closer to his former homeland. The boy clenched his fist in emotion and pressed it against his armor in the area of his heart, waiting for his friends to react to this happy news. However, they did not show any violent reactions. Some stood with an absent expression, some smiled softly, and some read mockery. Lilstein, smiling slyly, clarified whether it was true that Shihan was already unlikely to change his mind. The one confidently and ringingly affirmed the firmness and finality of his intentions. Lavina called out to Shahan, and in her voice, he heard an incomprehensible emotion. She gently placed her hands on his shoulders and kissed him, making even such a seasoned warrior embarrassed. He turned to her incomprehensibly, trying to figure out what she wasn't saying, but Lavina only continued to smile gently. A stiff smile played on her lips, and she said it got complicated. Shehan anxiously began to sense some sort of catch. He didn't recognize Lavina and wondered what had caused such a drastic change. Suddenly a portal opened behind him. It was obvious from the blue discharges that it was a portal to another world. Shahan looked around in an attempt to get his bearings. Something strange was happening that he could in no way foresee. Unclear silhouettes loomed in the dimensional portal. Shihan was perplexed as to how it could have opened when Lustlanad was already dead. He shouted a warning to his friends to look around and have time to react to the unknown threat. But after a second, a chill ran down Shihan's back and he looked at his friends. They stood without moving, perfectly calm, as if they all knew perfectly well what was going on. A fire burned in Lilstein's hand and in the depths of the flames something dark could be seen that had not long ago been alive. Shahan asked if this was the Emperor's heart, but even without an answer he knew that it was. The boy listened in horror to the words of Lilstein, who explained that even the death of the entire Laxlan family left one opportunity to open the portal, and that was the heart. Lilstein held the source of the last portal in front of him on his outstretched arm, the flesh slowly turning to ash. The mage coldly said he Shihan has become too powerful. The others added that apart from power, he has too much popular love and popularity. They didn't want Shihan to gain power and become stronger than all of them, to become something like a new emperor. So they thanked Shikan for saving the world from tyranny, but left him no choice and concluded that he must go back to his world. Shihan couldn't believe his ears, for his friends, the people he wasn't afraid to put his back to turned out to be the ones who took advantage of him. He turned to his beloved Lavina, expecting her to help him. She remained his last hope when everything was crumbling before his eyes. But his shout went unanswered, 
Shahan looked at the girl, and she only looked at him and didn't move. Lavina whispered his name, and he realized that she was in league with the others, and Shihan had no allies left. The girl continued to smile amiably, and it was in stark contrast to her cold voice that said Shihan should have left on his own. Shihan exclaimed in despair. He wasn't going to let things go so easily when it seemed like things should finally be fine. Lavina admitted that she dreams of power and is going to subjugate men who will shadow her greatness. And a supporting role where she is supposed to be just a companion to the great Shihan, she doesn't accept. Lavina condescendingly ran her finger along Shihan's chin and said with slight regret that Shihan was not fit to be her favorite. Shihan began to fall into a blue glow. He called out to Lavina and wanted an explanation from her. The girl jokingly remarked that she would help him deal with the pain he was now experiencing. And with those words, she pushed him in the chest, helping the portal pull the knight inside her. Shahan fell through the hole moving away, and Lavina shouted after him to come back. And after a second, she added snidely that he should return to his home, and her figure and the silhouettes of the other traitors began to move away. Shehan could no longer do anything and only cried out powerlessly as he flew through the void between worlds. The blue glow shuddered and dimmed, nothing could be seen in it anymore, and the portal began to slam shut. Just moments more, and one final discharge collapsed the passageway, raising clouds of dust from the dirty castle floor all around. The sun shone brightly over the lands of Terranor, as if proclaiming the coming of a new bright age for the people of the Empire. The prophecy was fulfilled. The great warrior killed the tyrant, and his allies proclaimed the glad tidings to the people from the balcony of the castle. Lilstein was declaring the beginning of the reign of six emperors, who were each to rule a different part of the Empire to prevent a new tyranny. The crowd cheered as they greeted the deliverers, not even realizing that the famous hero, Shihan, was absent from the celebration out of choice. It was a glorious time, a time when the people of Terranor could breathe in peace, free from strife and the oppression of exorbitant taxes. This went on for a long time, year after year, until one day a portal opened again in the world of Terranor. It was a sunny summer day, and the sky was filled with white lambs of clouds, contrasting with the dark green of the nearby mountain range. Hidden among the sparse trees was a small, well-kept cabin with a small vegetable garden next to it. The door of the hut opened, and a ringing maiden's voice was heard. A girl with blonde hair braided with a dark blue ribbon came out of the house. She was humming a song and carrying a basket. The girl was enjoying the weather. She seemed to be in a great mood and was going to do a good job. The bright sun was blinding her through the crowns of the trees, but the girl only covered herself with her hand and stepped toward the vegetable garden, carrying a handheld hoe in a basket. Not a minute later, the hoe was already in the ground and the work was boiling. The vegetable garden was soon to be put in full order. The girl continued humming a little song, happily tending to her plants. Suddenly, some indistinct sound caught her attention and she stopped working and listened to see what it was. Suddenly, a few meters away from the girl, a fish flopped into the vegetable garden, and it seemed as if it had fallen from the sky. The girl walked over in bewilderment and began to examine the fish that had appeared out of nowhere. The fish turned out to be flounder, and the girl was even glad, as this fish is very tasty, which means that she was going to have an unexpectedly pleasant dinner. But then she thought that perhaps the intention of eating fish that came from nowhere was reckless and even dangerous. The girl put the fish aside and decided to finish her work first and then deal with this mystery. At that moment, behind the girl's back, something big crashed with a rumble, raising a real column of dust and scattering the ground in different directions. The girl turned around apprehensively, assessing the damage done to her plants by the unknown projectile. As she got closer, she saw that there was a whole pig lying in the vegetable garden, leaving a whole crater underneath it as it fell. The girl looked up at the sky in awe, realizing that the uninvited gifts were falling from there and expecting another surprise. It didn't take long for the surprise to arrive, and the girl's eyes widened in an attempt to view the next object, which was already rapidly approaching. 
It appeared to be a man, or rather a dark-haired guy, who had dragged some of the vapor out of the clouds so that a misty plume was now trailing behind him. The guy cackled, looking at the ground and clearly not wanting to face her like that. It was then that the girl realized that the falling man had no clothes on, and the situation suddenly became even more awkward. The guy collapsed to the ground, kicking up such a cloud of dust that it took a little while for it to settle and become visible. The shocked girl hesitated to do anything about such extraordinary circumstances, when behind the clouds of dust, she saw a body sticking out of the ground. The guy stuck his head into the ground and stood almost like an ostrich except he was devoid of feathers. But then he pulled his head out of the ground and shook it to recover from such a hard landing. The stranger looked around confusedly, trying to figure out where he was. He saw the mountain ridge, the grove of trees surrounding the cabin, the thicket of weeds outside the vegetable garden, and seemed to be looking for familiar landmarks. Then he turned toward the hut and began to survey the yard, where there were carts with barrels and a neat stone well. The girl, without letting the puller out of her hands, approached and timidly said hello to the uninvited guest. But the guy didn't pay any attention to her. A smile played on his face. He seemed to be very pleased with something. He jumped up joyfully and laughed, and then shouted that he had gotten what he had been waiting for for years. The guy raised his hands triumphantly and shouted, addressing someone and announcing that he was back. His laughter was interrupted by weakness. The stranger stooped and then began to fall. Not a couple of seconds later, he was already lying unconscious in the middle of the vegetable garden, which was natural after such a thunderous arrival. The girl stood nearby, surrounded by clouds of dust that had not yet dissipated, and thought about the fact that today she would not be able to dig in the vegetable garden. Evening came, and the hut in the middle of the grove was plunged in darkness, but its windows glowed with warm living lights. The boy opened his eyes. He found himself lying on a clean bed and covered with a sheet. He turned his head, looking around the room. Next to the bed was a nightstand with a table lamp and a nice clock. The place looked very cozy. The boy asked himself where he was and tried to remember recent events. Just then, a beautiful blonde girl with a tray came up to him and pointed out that he was already awake. The girl showed the alien the porridge prepared especially for him and asked how he was feeling. The stranger struggled to rise and realized that he was naked under the sheet and then thought with shame that it was unlikely he had made it to the bed by himself. The guy started kneading his shoulder. He was in pain and lamented that the side effects of his appearance had had too much of an effect on him. Meanwhile, the girl wondered who was in front of her, for the guest used a strange tongue but did not look like a native of the hinterland. Meanwhile, the guy looked up, his face cleared, and he was relieved to say that he remembered he was no longer on earth. The stranger asked the girl if she had really helped him and brought him here, and the girl, answering in the affirmative, finally came over and put the tray on the nightstand. The guy bluntly asked where he was, and the girl finally dismissed the idea that he was from some tribe. She named the nearest landmarks, Mount Defalun, the village of Goran, but it said nothing to the stranger. Then, assuming the foreigner in front of her, the girl replied that they were in the territory of the Lilstein Empire. The boy whispered her words about the Lilstein Empire under his breath, and a predatory expression appeared on his face. He folded his hands in a lock and thought for a moment, muttering about Lilstein becoming emperor, and laced his thoughts with insult. At this point, both of them felt awkward as the guy looked comical, sitting on the bed in a pose like he was plotting something grand. He sprang to his feet and modestly asked the landlady for some clothes so that they might not be embarrassed by them. A little while later, a stack of empty bowls stood tall on the dining table located on the first floor of the house. The alien was munching away. It seemed the girl's dish was quite to his liking, or he was just too damn hungry. The only thing that confused him was the fishy smell, but he wasn't picky, figuring that some earthly comforts might not be available in this world. The boy was still glad to be back, and also sincerely thanked the hospitable girl for the generous treat. Ta continued to look at her guest with excitement, studying literally every inch of his body, 
and the slightest trait of behavior. She noted a fine physical form and a confidence bordering on cavalierness that spoke of this man's uneasy background. Everything said he might be an aristocrat, but it was unclear how that could be combined with falling from the heavens in the nude. The guy, showing manners, apologized for never asking the girl her name, but now wants to correct that oversight. The girl introduced herself. Her name was Alita, and she was farming like a normal villager. But the guy suddenly asked what she had to do with swordsmen then, as she seemed quite experienced by the looks of it. Alita froze in bewilderment at how he was able to figure her out, having seen nothing much and having only recently been here. She was careful to clarify where the stranger had gotten the idea in the first place, but he replied evasively that it just seemed that way to him. Alita decided to be frank in hopes that it would help to learn more about the guest herself as well, and confirmed that she was a free swordsman, sort of a mercenary. But the guy, satisfied with the answer, only upped the ante and said he had another question. He asked who Alita was to Emperor Lustlanad and a good-natured smile froze on her face. The guy didn't have time to blink before there was some sudden movement and something big flew in his direction. Alita overturned the table with lightning speed, hurling it at the stranger, throwing him along with plates and mugs to the floor. At the same time, Alita jumped to her feet, preparing to fight. From nowhere, a knife appeared in her hand and a look of determination on her face. She leapt over the table, lying on her side, ready to pin her opponent to the ground and deny him the ability to move. But the guy had disappeared so suddenly, as if he had vaporized, and Alita had to discover where he had gone. There were only the shards of broken earthenware pots lying on the floor, and no trace of where the stranger might have slipped away. She heard his voice at her back. He noted that he hadn't intended to fight her. Alita stabbed with a U-turn becoming more and more convinced that the sudden guest was capable of posing a greater threat. But her blow hit the void, causing her to stagger awkwardly and fly forward a few steps by inertia. Alita assumed a fighting stance again as she continued to analyze, and came to the thought that the stranger was probably a swordsman as well. She threw another nifty punch, but the guy was able to get away from it by bending over slightly. He didn't even try to attack back, and as he continued to dodge a series of punches from Alita, he exclaimed that he just wanted to talk. Alita appreciated her opponent's skill, seeing that he dealt with her attacks without error. She decided to use a last resort and employ a technique she rarely used, striking obliquely as if drawing an invisible net. The guy smiled contentedly and praised the way Alita skillfully hid her fighting talents. He backed away, ignoring the flurry of knife swings, taking stock of the fact that he could only see her aiming for his shoulders. The guest stated confidently that she was not trying to kill him and made a movement whereupon the knife stuck in the wooden spoon he held in his hand. The move was something of an insult to Alita when her truly dangerous attack was stopped in such a ridiculous way. She fell to the floor, thrown back by this unexpectedly powerful response and let the knife out of her hands. Lying on the floor, Alita looked up at the stranger, and he held out to her a spoon covered in tongues of orange glow that traveled up her arm. It was some unknown powerful technique, and Alita realized that it was pointless to fight any further, so she bluntly asked the guy who he was. The guest finally introduced himself. He stated that his name was Song Shi Han and that he came to this world from Earth. It was as if Alita had been electrocuted, the legendary Song Shi Han himself, who had once been summoned to this world through a portal because of a prophecy, was standing in front of her. She asked again if the guy was really the savior from the other world, and the guy responded satisfactorily, happy that he was still remembered. Shi Han said that he understood why Alita jumped on him as the suspicion of being related to Lustlanad might have been hurtful, but it wasn't a hint. Alita interrupted him and only said that she was Alatir's Bella Lustlanad Lusklan, and then she added, so that there was no doubt that she was the daughter of the late emperor. After the emperor's death, angry mobs with torches pursued anyone with any kinship to Lustlanad and sought to exterminate them. Alita would always remember that night as fire blazed through the castle and her mother Serafina cradled her daughter to her chest in a far room, hiding from the rebels. 
His mother had instructed the family bodyguard, Kieran, to take care of Alith, realizing she was putting him in great danger by doing so. Karan was loyal to the Imperial family and had no hesitation in taking responsibility for the girl, and perhaps the reason was even more than loyalty. The bodyguard had made a promise to Serafina to protect Alita at all costs, bitterly realizing that by doing so, he would have to leave Serafina herself unprotected. Alita did not understand what would happen next, but she felt that she would have to part with her mother, and so she cried bitterly. Years have passed since that terrible evening. Kieran has raised the girl as his daughter, settling with her in the wilderness and training her to fight so she can defend herself. However, despite all precautions, they were found, and the new emperor's soldiers killed Kieran while Alita was able to escape again. She maintained a hermit's lifestyle, engaging in occasional mercenary work to earn her livelihood. Shahan listened to her story, sipping from his mug and nodding understandingly as he tried to sympathize with the girl who had suffered so much misfortune. However, he asked since he killed her father, Alita should have animosity towards him, but she replied that she no longer associated herself with her father. Alita explained her attack by saying that the person who had learned of her kinship to the late emperor was likely to be a planted assassin. Shahan grudgingly muttered that his former allies might have asked him if he was okay with slaughtering the emperor's entire clan. And then, in a coy tone, he said that Alita had nothing to fear now because a beautiful man like him had fallen on her from the sky. Alita had that feeling of doing someone else and being embarrassed, so she called out to Shihan to change the subject. The girl asked, if he was really Song Shihan, how did he manage to return from another world to Terranor? He must have been summoned by someone. And as if casually adding the question of why he was traveling naked, Shihan blushed and accidentally squeezed the mug so that its handle flew off. He replied in a resentful tone, that he did not control the laws of how portals worked and that only living matter could pass through them. He said that's how he got here the first time, and then when he returned to Earth, he found himself naked in the crowded Kwang Hwamun Square. It was obvious that the memories made Shahan self-conscious, and Alita silently wondered about the meaning of Kwang Hwamun's outlandish words. She decided to bring the conversation back to the previous topic, and asked again who had summoned Shihan to Terranor ten years after returning to Earth. To which Shihan said that he had returned on his own, without the help of the Emperor's relatives. Alita experienced another shock at what else this extraordinary man was capable of. She only wondered how he did it. Shihan replied that it was a difficult task, and it had taken him ten years in his homeworld to solve it, and to be honest, someone had helped him. He paused at half a word and listened, though it was silent, except for the evening chirping of the cicadas in the courtyard. Sheehan turned around and peered at the grove through the window. The sudden silence startled Alita, and she asked what was wrong. The guy turned to Alita and paused. He didn't seem to dare to answer right away, because he was confused about something. He got up from his chair and asked if the girl was really still living here just so she couldn't be found, and she confirmed it. Shahan cursed and said with a mixture of chagrin and shame that he had made a mistake in coming here. Alita was still puzzled, so he continued, explaining that he needed someone to act as a summoner to open the portal. He added that since Alita was the next of kin, she fit the role perfectly and the girl's eyes went wide. It came to her why he'd immediately asked her about her kinship with Lustlanad, and Shihan had confirmed that she was his way of getting back here. But that wasn't all, because Shihan tensed up and began to explain that this had caused unintended consequences. The opening of the portal is noticeable to the mages, which means they will sense where it happened, locate Alita's dwelling, and see that she used magic. Alita was surprised, for she didn't possess magic, and tried to gauge what it would do to her. She jumped up determinedly from the table they had set down so they could have a proper conversation. The girl peered intently through the window into the darkness, expecting to see the intruders move. Lights could be seen among the trees. Someone was approaching, and there were many of them. Alita was dumbfounded at how fast they had gotten here. Knights in full-plate armor with pikes and torches were striding through the forest. No such units are sent after mere villagers. 
The soldiers were about a hundred meters away from the hut, and as they approached, they assessed how to cordon off the house to leave those inside no chance of escape. The sorcerer, who was traveling with the squad, reported to the commander that the source of the magical phenomenon was right here. The commander's name was Zeno, and he looked young with freckles covering his nose and cheekbones, but his sternness made you forget that deceptive impression. Zeno briefly thanked the clan sorcerer and began giving orders to his subordinates. The knights were to surround the house, and Zeno was assigning them to positions. Shehan, who had been watching his opponent's preparations through the window with interest until then, turned around and let out a surprised exclamation. Alita had managed to put on a protective leather suit that replaced her armor for lack of money for expensive armor. In her hand, she already held a sword. Shi Han noted to himself the lack of doubt and timidity in the girl's demeanor, thinking that it was as if she had been waiting for this moment all her previous life. He feared that she hated him now, since by his short-sighted choice he had revealed Alita's whereabouts, and now she was in great danger. Shi Han tried to find out what Alita was really thinking and asked her not to keep quiet if she wanted to say something to him. The girl responded, but at first she didn't understand what he wanted to hear, so she hesitated for a few seconds, but then responded quite unexpectedly, thanking her for the timely warning that had given her a chance to prepare. This wasn't what Shihan had expected at all, so he felt embarrassed again, as if he was like an admonishing parent beating the thanks out of her. Shouts could be heard outside, the knights demanding the owner of the hut to go outside, threatening to destroy the dwelling otherwise. Zeno instructed the sorcerer to scare the inhabitants of the house with some not-so-powerful spell to make them realize the seriousness of his intentions. The sorcerer began to conjure with the gusto typical of a master of his craft, summoning swirls of flame around his hands. It was the burning peak technique. Fire burst out of the sorcerer's palms and engulfed the hut in a tornado of fire, rising tens of meters high. Zeno didn't approve of the wizard's choice, Perhaps that was the calculation to make the spell seem dangerous, but if it really was, it was overkill. The knight reminded the sorcerer that they must deliver the girl alive, to which he assured him that the spell would not harm those inside, and muttered under his breath that, at most, there would be a few burns left, watching the soldiers cautiously approach the fire. Suddenly, the door of the burning house swung open, and Alita swiftly jumped out of it, leaping through the loose formation of knights. But the ring was not the only one, and the soldiers standing in reserve rushed to her side, emboldened by the promised reward. Alita began her martial dance, delivering smashing blows, toppling the soldiers, and making them confused. The knights didn't expect such fierce resistance. A chatter passed between them that they were fighting a swordsman. Despite her skill, Alita was having an extremely hard time, with too many enemies closing in on her, and she was looking for a way to slip out of the unequal fight. There was a second pause in the battle, and she turned around to see its cause. A blue flash flashed nearby, and a powerful impact threw the girl to the ground. She immediately returned to her stance and saw that the source of the flash was the magical sword in Zeno's hands, which was thrust into the ground where she stood. Zeno resented that Alita dared to attack the soldiers. Being far superior in her abilities, the blue glow around the sword seemed to pour out his anger. Alita saw that the opponent in front of her was wearing magical armor and a head stronger than her. This did not bode well. Zeno dealt her a powerful blow, and the girl was thrown to the ground again. Alita realized that in this fight she had to be dodged to stand any chance. But she wasn't going to completely give the enemy the initiative, so she gave her sword a counter-stab. However, this only caused her magical armor to flash blue, and the blow came back at her, causing her severe pain. The commander of the knights triumphantly stated that although Alita had a high-level sword, Zenon's armor was superior. He struck again, and though Alita was able to block the enemy's mecha, it didn't go unnoticed. The girl felt a sharp pain and screamed helplessly, unable to understand where the blood spurted from. Unable to resist, Alita flew back, dropping her sword. It looked like she had lost this fight. Zeno looked at her with a hard stare 
that said that would be the case with anyone who raised a hand against the Imperial Knights. The dust rising from the fight made the commander cough. Alita waited to be grabbed and taken away to an unknown destination. The girl felt what looked like a broken shoulder. Zeno suggested she stop resisting and was about to promise her decent treatment. But Alita admitted defeat herself and held her healthy hand up, saying she was giving up. Zeno was glad it was over and began to say that Alita should go with the squad. But then Zenon heard a loud and even a little cheeky call behind his back, which was addressed to the commander. There was a guy standing there without weapons or armor, wearing a simple linen shirt, and he rebuked Zeno for being so quick to turn from anger to mercy. The commander was taken aback by such insolence, while at the same time being at a loss as to how to understand it. This strange guy appeared as if out of nowhere, his always perfect reflexes had failed Zeno this time, so he didn't even notice his appearance. Shahan literally ignoring the presence of Zenon and the rest of the knights walked towards Alita sitting on the ground and catching her breath. The girl was also shocked. Zeno shouted sternly at Shihan's back, demanding an explanation of who he was. Shahan didn't even turn around and only apologized to Zenon in advance and admitted that he wasn't doing it out of personal animosity. And then, in an unexpectedly cold tone, he remarked that he was compelled to take action. Zeno stared at Shahan, unable to imagine how anyone could bluff like that. And if it wasn't a bluff, then how could this unarmed guy be a threat? At this moment, Shahan finally turned around, struck Zenon with his fist, from bottom to top so that he was thrown above the trees. The knight collapsed from his height and his armor rattled from the impact with the ground, a column of dust rising into the air for the umpteenth time that day. When it dissipated slightly, the soldiers saw that their commander had stabbed himself into the ground from the impact and was lying unmoving. A chill ran down the soldiers' backs, for if the girl was able to seriously damage them, then what could this unknown hero do? At this time, Alita blinked in surprise, for she was sure that Shi Han must be at loggerheads with the soldiers of the Emperor with whom they were allied. After the loss of the commander, a sorcerer took control of the unit. He demanded that the soldiers neutralize Shi Han. The knights rushed at Shi Han, causing him to be surprised and respectful at the same time, for they should have realized that this attack was pointless. Shi Han, reluctant and even a bit handsome, remarked that he didn't want to do this, but he would have to, and raised his fist. He then sent the knights flying after their commander, repeating his request that no offense be taken at him. Some of them he trampled into the ground, taking advantage of the fact that the armor was strong enough. The soldiers began to beg for mercy, trembling before such a mighty fighter, but he was already hard to stop. Zeno, meanwhile, came to his senses and slowly climbed out of the ground he was annoyed and burning to ask for answers for his humiliation. But then Zeno looked up, and the desire for revenge began to fade from what he saw. His soldiers were piled haphazardly in the vegetable garden, some stuck into the soil like saplings. Zeno couldn't believe his eyes. This simply couldn't be happening. They had encountered something abnormal that they weren't prepared for. The commander looked at the defeated soldiers and thought that he was still lucky, because it looked like the enemy could have done much more damage to him. It was then that it began to dawn on him. Somewhere at the bottom of his mind, a long, untouched memory was stirring. Zeno recognized the guy's movements. Another guy appeared in front of his eyes, only younger by ten years, wearing armor, but just as scattering the Imperial Guard, Song Shihan. The guy smiled at him just as Shihan had smiled back then, before giving his opponent a blow that couldn't be repelled. Shihan turned around to Zenon and noticed that he was awake. The guy noticed that since that was the case, the knight was proving to be a tough nut to crack. The guy started to approach, fair warning that Zenon would have to be unconscious for a while longer. The knight tried to stop him. He shouted, but Shihan's charged fist had already started moving. Zeno didn't have time to say anything. The blow only knocked the air out of his lungs. Shihan's hook sent him knocking him back into the hole he had punched after falling from a height. Shihan surveyed the carnage he had caused and once again asked everyone not to take offense at him, and the remaining conscious knights asked for peace. The boy agreed good-naturedly, 
threatening that if anyone else tried to attack him, he'd have himself to blame. The sorcerer tried to take advantage of this opportunity and began to organize a retreat. He wondered where a swordsman of such monstrous strength could have come from and what other surprises he could expect from him. Shahan turned back to Alida and assured her with amusement in his voice that there was nothing to be afraid of and that he could stop sitting on the ground. Alida came out of her stupor, still not fully believing what was happening, and agreed that it was a good idea. He and Shehan staggered away, while the knights looked back at them in fear, gathering up their fallen comrades. The sorcerer cursed in annoyance as he realized that they had suffered a complete failure and there was nothing they could do about it. Nevertheless, he instructed the knights to gather all the bodies of the slain to prepare them for the return journey. The sergeant of knights responded to the sorcerer's order with confusion and replied that it was not necessary. He reported that there were no fatalities in the battle. Examination revealed that the unknown fighter was so skillful that he managed to disarm everyone without killing or maiming them. The sorcerer thought he could wonder no more, but the sergeant's report made him wonder again what had even happened here this evening. This mute question hung in the evening grove, where the breeze quietly moved the leaves, and without noticing anything, the cicadas still crackled. Night was falling, but there was a full moon shining in the sky, so it wasn't completely dark in the grove. Alida wandered among the trees holding onto her broken arm, and Shahan followed her. He tried to encourage her by telling her that they would never catch up. He thought to himself that he really didn't want them to be followed, as he didn't want to advertise his appearance. Despite his bravado, he could sense that the move had not been easy, and he was not in the same shape he had been before returning to his world. His thoughts were interrupted by Alita's moan. She was in pain, and despite her best efforts not to show it, the sound involuntarily escaped her throat. Shahan asked her how she was and if she really had a fracture. Alita confirmed in a suppressed whisper that she did. She added that things could have been a lot worse, alluding to the way Shihan had stood up for her. Alida was trembling and her whole appearance was pained. But Shihan didn't seem to get the hint, so it was strange to him that Alida was so diligent in pretending that everything was fine. Before she knew it, he had constructed a splint on her arm for her and seemed to be using some kind of healing magic techniques. The pain in her arm receded, and Alida was scattered in gratitude. So Shihan was embarrassed, and scratching the back of his head, replied that it was nothing. Alita smiled broadly once more and summarized that she needed to go her own way to hide from her pursuers. Shihan was stunned at this abrupt turn. It was illogical that a girl who was in danger was going to part ways with the one who protected her. He hastily asked where she was going like that, and what she thought to herself. Alida, in response, only promised to be as careful as possible so he could not worry about her. Shehan objected that caution wasn't enough and that he could help her on her way, especially since he was responsible for what had happened. The girl was embarrassedly silent, and it was clear that she hadn't expected this attitude, but Shehan couldn't guess what she was thinking. Alida then looked up at the sky, pondered for a bit. The guy decided to give her time to make a decision. Finally, the girl smiled and replied that she was willing to accept the help of a powerful lord. Shehan was uncomfortable with such a formal address, so he asked to simply call himself by his first name. He asked the girl about her future plans to see what was in store for them when the chase began. Alita said that the easiest way would be to get to Gorin Village, but that was no longer safe, as someone would be sent there to intercept them first. So, the best option was a longer route over the mountain that would lead them to the trading city of Kagon, and agreeing, they began their journey. The bright sun illuminated the library in Lilstein Palace. The emperor, as a mage, surrounded himself with books, as knowledge was the basis of his power. One of the books Lilstein was leafing through right now, standing on the second floor while a report of yesterday's operation was to be delivered to him. The messenger's voice tore him away from the lines, and Lilstein turned to see a man hurrying toward him. The messenger approached and bowed courteously. He said that news had finally arrived from the squad of knights sent to Mount Defalan yesterday. Lilstein slammed the book shut. This information was interesting to him, and he looked forward to it. 
But the confused look on the messenger's face made him realize that things had not gone according to plan, and he demanded to be told immediately what had happened. The library was filled with volumes. There were common editions, reference books, treatises, but there were also rarities, the names of which only a few knew. But behind the facade of the library lurked another side of Lilstein's power. Dark galleries descended from the hall into the dungeons that hid its secrets. Lilstein stepped up the spiral staircase into one of them, the sound of footsteps faint in this place where the air stood as if dead. Lilstein walked to the door with the magic seal and cast a spell. Red spores ran down the furrows of the door like blood through blood vessels. The door swung open as if coming to life, letting his lord inside. Lilstein continued on his way. There was a laboratory in the dungeons. There were flasks and instruments huddled there. Books were gathered in cabinets hidden by strangers' eyes. And in the center stood a column filled with something that looked like blood. But all this did not occupy Lilstein for the moment. He moved on to where the faint voice called him by name. He approached the bars behind which the prisoner languished. The man in chains uttered in a weak voice that he hated Lilstein. He chuckled sarcastically at the fact that the emperor still considered himself a hero after what he had done, a magic circle glowing beneath the captive's feet. Lilstein only sneered that the prisoner had somehow gotten worse in the last half month and spat at him that he was a degenerate like the rest of the Lusklin clan. The mage entered the cell and asked if the prisoner could guess what it meant that the magic circle had recently changed color. The man didn't answer, and Lilstein answered himself, explaining that it meant the completion of the magical transformation. The captive ignored this and shouted furiously out of his last strength that Lilstein's subjects deserved pity because of such a ruler. Lilstein smiled coldly and said that he was sorry too, but for someone else. One who will lose his heart, he finished, and the captive slumped against the wall in horror, clammy terror filling his insides. The captive's eyes opened wide, he was staring into the face of death, and this death was completely indifferent to him, considered him a mere tool. Lilstein thrust his hand straight into the man's chest in a sharp motion, blood spattering in all directions coating the cell walls, the floor, the bars. The prisoner shuddered, his throat wheezed, and after a few seconds he fell silent, Lilstein methodically finishing what he had started. In the palm of his hand, just like ten years ago, a fire burned, devouring the flesh of a recently alive man. But Lilstein could already see that there was no result. The man whose heart he had burned was too distant a relative of the king, and the power was lacking. Lilstein sighed, firmly established in his opinion that he needed someone who was very close to Lustlanad in origin. He remembered again what the messenger had told him today, regarding the detachment sent for the man who might be the one Lilstein was looking for. A frightened messenger reported the failure, that the detachment had been defeated by one unknown fighter. Only his appearance was known, dark eyes, black hair, perhaps he was of the Gallen race. A stray thought crossed Lilstein's mind. Sheehan fit that description, but it was impossible. The mage pushed the obsession away, for portals do not open on their own. That skill was not available to even him right now. It is impossible, Lilstein told himself, and the image of the old acquaintance of whom he was now so afraid stood before his eyes. The crowded city with tall buildings, wide streets, and bright flags met the two travelers with its bustling life and brisk street trading. Sheehan told Alita that this city used to be called South Clanium, but the city had changed so much that the guy didn't recognize it, even though he had lived here in the past. Alita was surprised and asked how that happened, to which Sheehan explained that in the big city, it was easy for him to hide when he needed to hide. Sheehan said that there was a Gallen race that looked similar to the people of Northern Asia, here his face changed, as if it was a completely different person. Alita looked fascinated at Sheehan, who was now unrecognizable, though she knew it was him since he still spoke with his voice. She asked if the rumors about magical copycats were true, and he clarified if she was referring to the powers of the Empress's thousand guises. Sheehan said that the ability allowed him to use combat power to disguise himself, 
redirecting it to become like another person. He also added that this skill belongs to Levine along with the stealth skill, but it was Shi Han who invented it and taught it to Levine. The boy offered to teach Alita as well, but she refused and Shi Han still couldn't understand why she was rejecting his offers of help. Seduced by this refusal, he said they should at least get somewhere to sleep for the night, and Alita inwardly felt regret that she couldn't agree. They walked a few blocks, and Shi Han asked how Alita felt about staying at this inn. In front of him stood a tall three-story house that looked very presentable. Alita was surprised that Shi Han knew this inn as well, and he stood there seemingly engulfed in memories. The guy replied that he hadn't been to this inn before because there used to be a gallows instead, and something inside Alita's mind twitched. Shi Han saw a scaffold in front of him with a crossbar and a rough rope that had ruined many lives. Nevertheless, he smiled and said that the place had already changed completely. And with those words, he invited Alita in, but she didn't find the idea so appealing anymore. She wondered if they would then encounter ghosts at this inn. But Shihan, either in jest or in earnest, replied that if there was one, it was to see old comrades. The inside of the inn was cozy with many kegs of beer or wine on the first floor, dining tables and stairs upstairs leading to the bedrooms. After a brief conversation, the disgruntled innkeeper gave Shihan a room key. As he stepped away from the counter, the boy kept seeing the owner of the courtyard freaking out and looking unkindly after him. Shihan asked Alita if she knew why the innkeeper was angry, and she tried to softly explain. The thing was that Shihan poked everyone instead of using the respectful you, which made his manner of speaking seem boorish. They got to the room and the guy kept lamenting that he had completely forgotten all decorum. Alita said it didn't bother her, but the innkeeper was much older. It came to Shahan's attention that he was also addressing Alita in a panicky manner and she could sense his arrogance. Alita told him that she was used to it and there was no point in changing anything anymore. Shihan sat dejectedly on one of the beds and tried to tame the feeling of shame. The girl pulled him away from his worries, reminding him to concern himself with more practical matters, namely what his plans were, since they were already in Kegon. Shihan simply replied that he was going to stay by Alita's side in order to look around and get oriented after arriving. Alita immediately blurted out fearfully that she was against such a decision, mentally reproaching herself for being harsh. She immediately began to explain that because she was being stalked, he would be constantly threatened and she would blame herself for everything no matter what happened. Shihan didn't expect such a response. At Alita's phrase that she had no reason to take him on the run with her, he faltered, about to say something. Shihan said he had to confess. Wanted is not easy. Alita listened to him carefully, expecting another surprise. The guy said that as soon as he left her, she would be captured immediately. The girl was scared, wanting to know why he was sure of that. Shihan explained that they were found because the summoning is felt by other mages as a surge, and since no one knows about it, the source is thought to be her. Shihan still summoned the vibrations of magic, so while they were together, he unwittingly left traces that she would be easily found by. Alita realized that her attempt to hide in another city was completely overturned by this new knowledge. She was in the night's grasp. Shahan said that he had already made sure that the vibrations would stop being summoned, but he couldn't do it yesterday yet. The guy said that in order to keep them from being found, you have to use the technique again every couple days to hide their presence. Alita suppressedly agreed that she needed Shahan's presence, but something else was bothering her. He sat in front of her, ready to hear what she had to say, and Alita wondered what he needed her for. The Imperial Palace in the capital city of Delstre had a strict architecture, as if it was obeying a statute, just like the military commanders sitting inside. Knight Zeno fervently pleaded with his commander, the most excellent in Darwin, to allow him to send him to find the fugitives and cleanse his tarnished honor. And Darwin looked at him skeptically and only sighed meaningfully. Zeno was not the first knight to mess up military plans with personal motives. The officer tried to dissuade the knight, pointing out that the Emperor must be aware of the fugitive's strength since no punishment followed the failure of the mission. 
However, Zeno reminded him that the code required a knight to do whatever it took to regain his honorable name if he failed to follow orders. And Darwin stirred. It had been a long time since the knight's code had been mentioned to him, and he realized he was facing a fanatical knight, the likes of which had been many before. The officer was imbued with the fervor of Zeno's speeches, so he decided, since that was the case, let him really go to fulfill his duty of honor. Zeno thanked Endarvan and left the office, but in truth, barely had his hand touched the doorknob, his thoughts were already far from duty of honor. The knight pondered where the fugitives could be found, most likely as swordsmen they would try their hand at mercenary work. Since they weren't found in the village, it seems they had traveled to Cargon, and Zenon could pretend to be a customer to bait them out. Zeno didn't care about the girl the emperor was sending for, no. His mind was occupied with the unexpectedly strong fighter who was with her at the time. Before Zeno's inner gaze, his figure kneading his fists surfaced again, a figure that was all too familiar. The fighter was a copy of the savior from the other world, Song Shu Han, but the latter had left their world ten years ago, and there was no one else who could summon him here. Zeno was eager to find out what this mysterious stranger was. It was more important than any outstanding orders. A meeting was held in Cargon in the stone house of the Knight Barcelian, which resembled a small fortress. Letward, the butler, appeared in the hall and greeted the master of the house, reporting that guests had arrived. Barcelian clarified if these were the visitors he was expecting. Outwardly, this knight looked more aristocrat than actual fighter. The butler confirmed that the visitors were a pair of swordsmen recommended by Karugan. As they entered, the butler introduced Lita Relkin and Sean Stein. Alita asked in a whisper why Shi Han had settled on Sean, to which he replied that it would be inconspicuous if she inadvertently called him by his real name. The pair stood modestly in the center of the hall as they were introduced, the butler reporting that they both had the rank of swordsmen. In the world of Terranor, Hand-to-hand -hand warriors were divided into six ranks depending on the degree of magical ability. The first rank, Grain, only gave the ability to increase one's physical strength through magic. The warrior rank meant that its bearer was able to put magic into weapons made of iron, so most swordsmen had this rank. Fighters received the rank of knight if they could make their armor magical, and the rank of master meant that its bearer could make any weapon magical. Finally, mighty warriors, who could create a blade by imbuing magic into the air itself, carried the rank of deity. In the history of Terranor, the bearers of this rank could be counted on one's fingers. Before returning home, Shihan was one of them. Listening to him being introduced, Shihan unhappily thought about how low he had fallen in his rank because of traveling between worlds. But Barcelian, on the contrary, thought that a rank warrior was a sign of great talent for a young guy like Shihan, so he was happy to see them. He filled the mercenaries in on the details of tomorrow's sortie and advised them to get a good night's rest, as they would definitely need their strength. Alida and Shihan came to his room. The guy collapsed on his bed and began to regretfully mutter that he was bored doing someone else's errands. Then he added, that in the old days he would have just robbed an aristocratic estate instead. Alita stopped examining the sore arm and looked at Shihan in surprise, saying that it didn't fit the image of the savior. Shukan replied that his former lover Lavina was a thief, and they saw nothing wrong with that, as the nobility under Lustlanada were scum. But now things had changed, and Shihan regretfully recognized that their only path remained the honest livelihood of heroes chopping their enemies to pieces. Alita thought it didn't sound very heroic from the outside, and as if guessing, Shihan suggested that they would have to fight some kind of monster. The girl replied that Barcelian had mentioned something about a pack of igneous wolves. This is not the first attempt to get rid of them, but the previous squad was small in number and now they have decided to strengthen their ranks with mercenaries. Shahan smiled and said that the igneous wolves were the first monsters he had encountered, and his friends helped him defeat them. A grim image from ten years ago rose in his mind, figures as if painted black, staring blankly at his fall into the portal. The smile disappeared, 
and Shihan's gaze became hard. He suddenly became silent. But after a little while, he regained his good-natured expression and encouraged Alita that these monsters would be just right for their first assignment together. Alita hesitantly asked why Shihan thought that he had lost all his strength if he handled her with just a wooden spoon. But the guy admonishingly raised his finger and said she needed to look on the bright side. He had to use a spoon to deal with her. Shihan explained that he was like an international champion who, even without equipment, could beat a fully equipped rookie through experience. Alita repeated the unfamiliar words, international champion, but Shihan was too lazy to explain, so he just suggested that she go to bed. The morning was just as clear. Summer in Terranor was enjoying its beautiful weather. Barcelian was inspiring his soldiers before the sortie. He was clad in armor and was giving a pathos speech. In front of the soldiers, raising his sword upward, the knight promised to destroy all the brats who had settled on his land without invitation. The soldiers let out an excited cry, while Shihan looked on skeptically as he assessed the aristocrat's equipment. The armor was good for fighting against other knights, but when fighting monsters, it only restrained movement with its weight. He and Alita were still wearing the light attire that gave maximum maneuverability. Shihan stated that the knights hadn't changed at all. The squad had been pacing for a long time. When a guy asked Alita walking beside him how her arm was feeling, she replied that the wound was on the mend. Shihan said that it was good because it was time for her to get ready for the fight, but Alita didn't immediately catch on to what she was talking about. The guy hinted that there was a sulfurous smell wafting through the air. It seemed the other members of the squad had smelled it too and started looking around. Suddenly, a large carcass jumped out of the bushes at the people. But because of the speed, no one realized what was happening. Barcelian shouted the command to take a circular defense, but his voice sounded too frightened for the commander. A whole pack of huge red wolves appeared from the thicket, smoke billowing from their mouths and tongues of flame shooting from their eyes. The knight shouted triumphantly to the wolves to attack, holding his sword out in front of him and anticipating how he would deal with them. However, the nearest wolf rushed at him so sharply that it knocked him down and knocked the sword out of his hand. Shihan looked at this, feeling ashamed of Barcelian, realizing that the latter was a worthless warrior, as for an aristocrat. Other wolves began to crowd the soldiers, and those, frightened by their commander's fall, began to dismount and Barcelian shouted at them, trying to keep the formation. Sheehan decided that it was time to save the situation and gave a powerful blow to the wolf nearby. The beast fell to the ground, its red-hot blood spurting out. The lad assessed and realized that he would have enough skill to outbreed the pack on his own, but he decided to be careful not to stand out too much. While Sheehan was looking for a new target, the soldiers were still panicking, thinking that they were doomed. Although perhaps they weren't so wrong, Shehan felt heavy footsteps echoing on the ground. Something big was approaching from the forest. A giant-sized wolf, three meters tall, appeared in the clearing, blue electric shocks dancing on the ends of its fur. Shehan, who had thought that the fight would be boring, smiled contentedly. The pack leader had become his main target. He staked out his sword in front of him, watching carefully to see what the giant creature would do. Those soldiers who still had some self-control panicked and fled into the forest, but Shihan didn't need them. Barcelian tried to stop his subordinates. He too realized that the death of the lead wolf was a chance to scatter the entire pack. But seeing that the soldiers had already hidden behind the trees, Barcelian also lost his presence of mind and shouted that Shihan and Alita should handle the wolf. Alita walked over to her partner, looking at him wondering what they should do now and Shihan joked that there were often difficulties in a mercenary's job. So the guy instructed Alita to deal with the leader, and he himself planned to neutralize the rest of the pack. The girl clearly did not expect such a turn. Throwing back the wolf that jumped at him, Shihan said that it was just a bunch of wolves, and they should be able to handle it. Striking the next beast with his sword, he shouted to the stunned Alita to attack. The girl decided to trust Shihan's tactics and obediently rushed towards the pack leader, gaining momentum for a powerful strike. She leapt to strike from above, 
Where gravity would give the blow extra energy, the wolf raised its head towards her, opening its maw. A stream of blue flame, with electric discharges swarming around it, flew out of that mouth towards Alita, and she couldn't dodge the jump. Feeling the heat and pricks of thousands of electric needles all over her skin, she swung her sword, aiming for the wolf's vulnerable spots on its muzzle. The wolf ducked, and the blow struck him in the side, and though blood spurted from the wound, the blow was tangential and only enraged the beast. The wolf bared fangs the length of a man's forearm and roared so that the crowns of the nearby trees swayed. Alita regrouped, and while the wolf roared, she was already lashing out with another attack, trying to think of something more effective than the previous attack. The wolf gave her the opportunity, tilting its muzzle to meet her, and the swordswoman thrust her sword at the wolf's eye, putting all her speed into the blow. Jahan, who had scattered the wolves, took a moment to look back and felt respect for his partner. But he saw everything change in a fraction of an instant, and for the first time since his arrival he experienced consternation. The sword was sticking out of the wolf's forehead, but he didn't think to fall. By dictate of a nightmarish coincidence, the blade stuck in his brain didn't result in death or unconsciousness. Alita was more than a little frightened, too, for she was sure she had made it, and now her sword was sticking in the wolf's muzzle high above the ground. The wolf made a burst of electricity, and a powerful electric arc passed through the girl. She flew aside and collapsed to the ground unconscious, surrounded by lightning bolts running across the ground. The wolf sprang towards her and grabbed her in his jaws. It was unclear if he was going to bite her in half and throw her with all his might. Sheehan let out a menacing cry, shouting out Alita's name. She didn't hear it, of course, but this cry gave him strength himself. Earlier, when they were at the inn discussing their future plans, Alita had asked Shihan what his interest in her was, why he wanted her. Shihan had another confession to make at that moment, but he tried to be honest with the girl about everything. He told her how summoning from another world worked, and then that for his first summoning, the Emperor had used other people's hearts. Therefore, the Emperor could no longer just send him back to Earth even if he wanted to. This time, Shikan has made Alita his summoner, and so he needs her to stay in Terranor. Shahan rushed towards the wolf, realizing that ridiculous bad luck could send him back to Earth so soon. After all, if Alita dies, the ritual that summoned him to this world will cease to work. The girl was unconscious and the wolf was carrying her away in its jaws. Shuhan couldn't catch up to the giant by simply running. He realized he was wasting energy running, and the chance to speed up was getting farther away from him with every second. He needed to think of something, urgently. Shihan regretted giving his partner a risky errand ten times when he should have been keeping her safe, the naked walk in the square already looming in front of his eyes. He stopped, drew his sword and began the ritual of using a powerful technique. He had to risk putting everything at stake. Shihan pointed his sword towards the wolf, a fiercely whipping blue stream came off the blade and flew towards the wolf. It was dragon sword energy. The wolf sensed a threat approaching from behind and turned around to face the inexorably rushing wave. A flash of interacting magic flashed, the energy of the dragon sword piercing the wolf's electric defense. Shahan angrily waved his sword, interrupting the attack, and the blue stream whipped its tongues in different directions and extinguished. He sent his sword into the scabbard. The surrounding area was stained with the wolf's blood. Guy pulled the unconscious Alita out of the predator's jaws and collapsed on the grass beside her, wondering what the desire not to give himself away was leading to. The girl did not come to her senses for a long time, and dusk began to thicken over the forest. Shihan made a fire and helped the recovered Alita to sit down next to him and warm up. The girl felt fine. It seemed the wolf wasn't trying to kill her. She assumed it had something to do with the wolf's custom of possessing the rudiments of reason, and perhaps they were going to eat her ritually. Alita was also surprised at the existence of a firewolf wielding electric magic, but Shihan replied that whatever it was, the wolf was dead. An unspoken question froze on Alita's lips, and she looked carefully into Shihan's eyes. Finally, she began to speak, 
and Shihan thought she might now reproach him for literally putting her on the brink of death. Instead, she asked something she hadn't dared to ask in a long time, namely, why Shihan hides his identity from others when he is a legendary hero. The current emperors must be his friends, which means he could return triumphantly, and everyone in Terranor would be happy to see him. In response, Shihan said that it would actually be great luck to stay alive if the news of his return reached the capital palaces. He confessed that his friends had betrayed him by kicking him back to Earth by force, a scene that had been in his face for ten years. Shahan said he never could understand how they could turn against him after all they had been through together. The fact that none of them had any doubts meant that they had all created and kept this plan secret for a long time. The guy and the girl were silent. He didn't want to talk anymore. She was digesting what she had heard. So the silence was filled with the crunch of the fire. Shahan thought about the fact that the girl might have been frightened after all. She was forced to be by his side, as it turned out to be the enemy of the people in all six kingdoms. But Alita only slapped her palm with her fist, expressing that everything had fallen into place. She only blurted out that it meant that Shihan had come back for revenge. The guy asked if she had fully understood what followed from his words, and the girl answered in the affirmative, clarifying what confused him. Shihan couldn't stand it and exclaimed that he was actually a person who was threatened by the power of all six kingdoms, and she didn't even bat an eyebrow. Alita only calmly replied that she had already been an outlaw for all those ten years, so his appearance didn't change anything for her. Shihan gave credit for this approach to life, to which Alita smiled and said that her father also praised her for her optimism. The boy incredulously asked if she was talking about the Emperor, but the girl immediately shook her head in the negative and explained that she was talking about Kirin. Shihan realized how much the dead bodyguard meant to his partner and how far the Lustlanad heiress was from her cruel ancestor. Their conversation was interrupted by an indistinct rustle. Alita paid no attention to it, but Shihan became alert and began to peer into the thick of the forest. He said that something was definitely moving in their direction and prepared for a possible attack. The guy and girl got to their feet. Alita was still unsure of her feet, and Shihan was ready to use his full strength without delay. The sounds were getting closer. Alita asked if it could be an enemy, to which Shihan said it was more likely someone lost from Barcelian's squad. The guy told his partner to get ready, because the crunching of twigs and rustling sounded very close by. From behind the bushes appeared a man wearing a cuirass over a plain shirt. It was a man but it was still hard to recognize him in the darkness. The man raised his voice, apologizing for the disturbance and asking for directions, but as he came even closer, he hesitated. Shahan and Alita were also shocked. In front was someone they didn't expect to see here. Knight Zenin came out to the fire, though not in full attire anymore, with his sword behind his back, but his appearance did not show hostility. Zeno was puzzled as well, this meeting had come as a surprise to them all. Alita, despite her condition, drew her sword and was ready to strike Zenon with all her might in retaliation for her injured arm. The point of the sword whistled a centimeter from Zeno's face, but he drew back without attacking. He waved his unarmed hands and asked to stop, claiming he didn't want to get into a fight. By this time, Shihan was already breathing down the back of the knight's neck, causing the knight to still have fresh, unpleasant memories. Shihang muttered that no matter what, Zenon would have to sleep again, and gathered magical energy into his fist. And with a practiced movement, he once again sent the knight flying so that his lats only jingled. But Zeno in the air was completely convinced of his assumption and concentrated his magic as well. This allowed him not to collapse down powerlessly, but to perform a smooth flip and land on his feet keeping him stable. This was a serious surprise to Shihan. It wasn't that the knight had become more dangerous, but it was a mystery how he managed it. The knight landed a dozen paces away from where he was standing before, and Shihan staggered over to him to find out what was up. He directly asked the knight how he was able to cancel the magic strike. After all, it was the application of a rare personal skill that few people know about. 
Now already, Shihan wanted to find out who Xenon was and what he knew. Zeno only replied that he didn't know anything, but he had his hunches, and those hunches were fully confirmed by today's meeting. The knight reached into his bag with his hand, and Shehan, thinking that there might be a weapon in there, prepared to repel the blow. He shouted a question to the knight about what he was trying to get at, making it clear that the reaction would be immediate. However, upon seeing what Zainan was pulling out of the purse compartment, Shihan was stunned at a loss for words. With a stony expression, Zenon picked up the retrieved object and held it out to Shihan under his nose. They were underpants, blue striped, cleanly washed and neatly folded. Zeno asked if they belonged to Shahan. Shahan and Alita froze at the absurdity of what was happening. If this was the Emperor's plan to capture them, he had no shortage of imagination. But Zeno continued to hold the briefs in front of him, a satisfied smile spreading across his face as if he had achieved a long-desired goal. Forgetting his promise to keep Alita safe, Shihan asked the girl to kill the pervert, to which Zenon again asked for his word. He apologized and said he was misunderstood, but Shahan was so discouraged that he didn't really want to listen. Zenon waved his underpants, yelling that he was surrendering, and the pair thought he was using the rag as a white flag. But then a tag caught Shihan's eye, one that wasn't usually found on underwear sewn in Terranor. It was a tag with his name on it. The guy recognized his handwriting on the tag. He realized that it was indeed an item that belonged to him and that he hadn't expected to see. Zeno triumphantly confirmed that there was no mistake here. All that was left was for Shihan to admit that he was indeed a savior from another world. Shihan realized that this man recognized him, despite the power lost due to displacement, and now Zeno was asking if Shihan remembered him. It turned out that Shihan had saved Zenon as a child twelve years ago in Baron Village. The knight spoke of it with real warmth. Shihan struggled to remember what had happened there in those long-ago times, and what kind of village Baron was, for there were more than one similar story. Zenon said that back then, Shihan had also defeated the Imperial soldiers with the skill of throwing from a height to the ground. Shihan's mind flashed back to the village, the knights haphazardly stuck into the ground and the grubby boy sitting on the ruins. Shihan himself was young at that time and was just entering strength, but in this boy's eyes, he was already the greatest hero. Zeno then decided to become a swordsman himself and studied the techniques the savior possessed particularly his technique to cancel the ground strike skill. When Zenon said, a skill that didn't cripple an opponent spoke of Shihan's humanism, he remembered that he was just experimenting, but tactfully remained silent. This was when Shahan realized, after all, if this knight was a child twelve years ago, then he was very young. Zenon confirmed that he was only twenty-two, even though he was already a squad leader and looked like a solid man. In response, the knight replied that appearances are secondary to the inner beliefs that determine a person's worth. But when asked what the phrase was, Zeno replied that it was a quote from the Savior, and Shihan felt like a star, for he was being quoted. However, it wasn't clear to him even after all the explanations what underwear had to do with it. But the knight said that it wasn't just underwear. He admitted that it was part of a collection of things related to the Savior from another world. There were several books in that collection. Also sketches of images of the Savior that were drawn while Shihan was still traveling Terranor. Zeno simply and openly admitted that he had worshipped him, the legendary hero since that moment in his childhood. Shihan himself didn't know what to think in such a situation. He had never heard such confessions before but ten years of absence had prepared him some special surprises. Zeno said they were the underpants the Savior had worn during the battle with Lustlanad, and they had cost him an astronomical amount of money. Shahan wanted to stop these revelations, so he simply asked Zenon to hide the ill-fated underpants away because the matter was over. Zeno knelt down and presented the sword to Shihan. The knight said he had served Lilstein as an ally of the Savior, but now he wanted to serve him himself. Shihan asked what he would do if Lilstein suddenly turned out to be an enemy of the Savior. 
Zeno did not hesitate to reply that Shihan's enemies would become his enemies because he believed in his idol and his fight against evil. The knight humbly waited for an answer. He had put his entire fate on the line at this moment, admitting his willingness to renounce the emperor. Shihan was silent and pondered the situation, weighing the pros and cons. This man was contradictory. In the end, he agreed. After all, since Zanon knows who Shihan is, he should be kept nearby, so the only thing left to do is to trust him. Shihan took Zanon's sword and tried its weight, assessing what kind of warrior was capable of handling it. Since he had become an idol, he exercised his right to take a knight into his service and solemnly listened to his oath. Zenin's stride looked happy. It looked like something he never dreamed of had come true. The knight fervently promised not to fail and justify his trust, and then volunteered to exterminate the remaining wolves. Shihan replied that there was no need for that, since the ringleader had already been defeated and was lying a couple dozen meters away from the clearing. Zeno was surprised and added that he may not have understood his newly minted commander's entire plan. He said that fire wolves always live in pairs and suggested that the corpse of the giant wolf was bait to kill its female. Shihan realized that bravado with experience sometimes misfired and that he had completely forgotten little things like the family background of some monsters. As he once again fought an attack of shame, Alita felt a chill inside because they had been carelessly sitting there all this time. All three of them approached the carcass of the dead wolf, and an even more massive and eerie she-wolf rose to her paws out of the shadows. Around the she-wolf danced an elaborate dance of tongues of magical flame. She slowly began to approach the company of heroes, surprisingly silent. Shehan cursed himself for such a shameful oversight, Obviously, the huge ringleader couldn't be a loner, otherwise he wouldn't have a good life. Alita asked what about the boasted experience, to which Shihan reproachfully replied that a person who graduated long ago wouldn't be able to solve the equation either. The girl asked what an equation was, and Shihan scratched his head, realizing that he needed to do a better job of choosing examples when explaining. Zeno, on the other hand, took the she-wolf as a chance to prove himself and fervently asked Shihan to let him deal with the beast. Shihan agreed, determined to fulfill the knight's request and get rid of the troublesome job at the same time. Zeno stood in front of the she-wolf and drew his huge sword. The beast didn't seem to realize what a serious opponent it would have to deal with. Zeno wanted to demonstrate the highest level of his skill to impress his idol and earn respect. After all, the last time, he had only stabbed himself twice in combat, and that could not be called a decently fought battle. The knight began the ritual, and yellow sparks began to surround him. Where the sword tip cut through the air, the weapon was infused with magic. Alita marveled at this skill, and Shihan condescendingly remarked that Zeno was overzealous and could have been defeated in a simpler way. The she-wolf tore toward Zenin, at the same time opening her jaws and striking from the side with her huge, ignited claws. Shihan struck back with his sword, releasing a wave of bright yellow glow that was directed at the beast's head. The knight let out a battle cry. Now he himself was like an igneous wolf, his eyes also burning. Swing after swing followed, dealing the she-wolf crushing blows time after time, though she was clearly not going to give up easily either. Alita was under a strong impression. Now she realized how strong an opponent she had fought then in front of her dwelling. Here, Shihan rubbed his chin and asked if Alita agreed that although she was a skillful warrior, this guy was also good at something. Alita indignantly asked what the phrase something skillful meant, to which Shihan smiled and replied that geniuses were annoying and that he had inflated expectations. Then he added that he was, of course, not even a genius just an alien from Earth, and that the genius he knew was Levina. Alita at this time thought that Shihan was nostalgic for the old days since he remembered this Levina so often. Meanwhile, Zanin's fight continued. Flames began to burst from the she-wolf's mouth to the sides. She seemed to have accumulated enough fire in her. A wave of tension shook her body, and a sizzling jet rushed forward, burning everything in its path. 
but Zeno was strong enough to block the effects of the fire, breaking the jet with his sword. He made a leap, about to plunge his sword into the wolf's forehead, just as Alita had done shortly before. Alita's lips wanted to burst out with a warning not to do that. Shihan wanted to slap himself in the face with the palm of his hand, but he was also amused. The she-wolf hurled a lightning bolt at Zanan falling on top of her, which he clearly didn't expect so much that he even dropped his sword. The knight fell to the ground, trickles of smoke rising from him. The magic had not critically harmed him, but he was temporarily out of the battle. Alita asked if she looked exactly the same from the outside, to which Shihan laughingly replied that he was having deja vu. Zeno shouted an indignant question to his comrades as to how come the firewolves were starting to strike with lightning. Alita offered to defeat the wolf thinking that she already knew about the catch and would handle it more successfully this time, but Shihan decided to do it himself. He said his main feature was his immunity to magic, and Alita realized it had to do with being transported from another world. The power of the creatures her kind was famous for summoning was based on the ability to not take damage from magic. Song Shihan, despite his human nature, was just as much a creature he was now standing in front of the she-wolf in a relaxed pose. The monster spat fire again, putting all its fury into it. Shihan ignored the fire without even using any techniques. The magical nature of the flames did not allow the flames to interact with him. The guy smiled because before he couldn't afford to turn around because of the extra eyes, but now they were here alone. The she-wolf let out discharges of lightning, and Shi Han suddenly received a full charge so that his teeth chattered. Zeno was as amazed as his idol, and Alita thought that sometimes Shi Han should be careful with his arrogance. How's that for deja vu? She shouted at him, to which he irritably demanded that she not mock him. Shi Han jumped to his feet, absorbed in the thought of how come the magic had worked on him while the she-wolf's jaws were already flying towards his head. Hearing the whistle, Shihan abruptly turned around with an expression as if he was about to swat an annoying fly. He swung his sword, letting out a blue arc so bright it seemed white, putting there all the anger for the sudden humiliation. The she-wolf rolled and flew a few dozen meters away like a gutless rag. Shahan, on the other hand, thought that the magical fire didn't hurt him, which meant that the electric discharge was something different. Zeno ran up to him asking if Sir Shihan was all right to which the man insistently asked him to just call him by his first name from now on. Here they all looked around as a strange, ghostly light began to stream from the body of the defeated monster. The carcass began to disintegrate into small, glowing wisps that flew up into the sky and dissipated. The whole company stared puzzled at yet another unfamiliar magical effect, adding a new mystery to everything that was going on. Shihan watched carefully, he realized that he hadn't seen anything like this yet. If this was some magician's sorcery, then he possessed a special magic. The next day there were cheers, and the company of the two mercenaries was very cordially welcomed into the house of Barcelian. The aristocrat was quite sincerely grateful to the warriors for ridding his lands of the plague, shamefully not remembering his escape. For the errand completed, Barcelian gave them two weighty purses, in which six hundred silver coins were poured. Leaving the manor, Shihan shook his purses in satisfaction and told Alita that it was not a bad profit, although they would need more money. Money fever had already flashed in the guy's eyes, and he was thinking aloud about where else to find challenging assignments, while Alita looked at him skeptically. They met Zenon on the street, and he asked if the payment for the errand was all right. Then he added that he had heard them talking about money from afar and held out another purse with a hundred gold coins. Shihan and Alita stared at this wealth in disbelief, wondering where Zeno got it from. They pounced on him with questioning, and Zeno sank down before answering. Knight admitted that he had sold the very same savior's underpants, and it was a significant loss to his collection. Shihan already regretted his decision to find out the origin of the gold, and Zenon said he would do anything for his commander. Alita snidely remarked that if Shihan's underpants were so expensive, they could sell another one, to which Shihan hastily countered that those were special. Zeno asked what their future plans would be, given that they had enough money for a certain amount of time and could stay out of the mercenary business for now. 
Sheehan replied that he had three options, but he hadn't made up his mind definitively yet, and that there was one spot that wouldn't be hard to win. He was going through the gold coins at this time and looking at the image on one of them with interest. Shehan uttered that he would finally see his face again, and Alita and Zenon looked at Shehan questioningly to see who he meant. Shehan said that he had made up his mind and that they were to go to the north, his face darkening. Their target was the kingdom of Jacksongard, and it was his face, the face of a former ally and traitor at the same time, that was minted on the coin. There was a conversation going on in Lilstein's laboratory, though no one was visible except the Emperor. The interlocutor's voice came from a tub filled with water and standing on the table. It was Trandon, one of Lilstein's powerful sorcerers. The Emperor asked good-naturedly why Trandon wanted to talk to him, since it was not yet time for the next report. Trandon broke the news that subjects 11 and 12 were no longer leaving a problem, as Barcelian was able to deal with them himself. Lilstein hummed approvingly. The wolves really weren't very strong, and maybe there was just someone who could handle them. But that wasn't all, Trandon seemed hesitant to say and stalled for time. Finally, he squeezed out that the Subject One was also lost, causing Lilstein's face to contort into a grimace of rage. Lilstein leaned into the water so that Trandon on the other side experienced fear despite the distance that separated them. Lilstein shouted, how dare Trandon consider himself the head of the Ivory Tower if he made such a mistake. The four magical towers of Terranor, red, white, blue, and black, were made of ivory. The previous emperor, being the most powerful mage, collected knowledge and wisdom in these towers. Knowledge was distributed according to complexity and sophistication on the floors so that new mages would rise higher and higher as they learned. Lilstein was the head of the Red Tower. He had reached the highest level of skill. The Emperor reminded Trander that he was only in charge of the tower for the reason that his rivals had been executed and that he belonged on the eighth floor. Lilstein demanded to deal with Subject One as quickly as possible and warned that this was the last chance. Trander felt a drop of sweat trickle down his temple. Lilstein's face disappeared and only water remained in the tub. Trander sighed heavily. He tried to calm his nerves because they wouldn't help him with the issue. After all, he could have been ordered to be killed by now, but instead he could still try to save the day for now. In a semicircle of mountains to the north was the capital of the kingdom of Jacksongard, adorned with a monumental royal palace. The heels of a man dressed in white clapped as he strode down the palace corridor, which was lined with elaborately decorated tiles to the royal chambers. The man opened the massive door and looked around for the king. Then he called out to his master. Emperor Jackson guard withdrew and asked his squire what was the matter and why he was bothering him. However, being in good spirits, Jackson guard invited the squire to have a drink together. The latter approached and saw the emperor surrounded by wine and girls. The squire asked wearily if the emperor was once again indulging in amusement, forgetting everything else. Jackson guard replied that what else is the point of being emperor than to enjoy whatever your soul desires? The squire warned that a life spent in feasting when matters that are brewing are not resolved is dangerous to imperial power. Jackson guard brushed it off, confidently stating that the people loved him and his power was not threatened. The squire inwardly resented that Yaxengard didn't realize that people could be enraged by the sight of a ruler who was siphoning off the money collected from their taxes. Jacksongard remarked that he had lowered the taxes, to which the squire replied that even so they remained high. Jacksongard stated that Luslanad was burning villages and taking people into slavery, and the squire parried that now people were simply being punished or taken into the army. Jackson Guard shook his head and said that he could not be compared to a tyrant and that he deserved the reward for overthrowing Lustlanad. The squire was about to say something else, but Jackson Guard's patience was at an end and his voice sounded like steel. The emperor looked sternly at his subordinate and said with a pressure that he did not understand innuendo. The squire startled and faded his gaze. He realized he had overreacted to this argument. He bowed, submitting to the will of the ruler and healing, headed for the exit. 
Already out of the door, the squire covered his face with his hands, resentment raging in his soul and a premonition that nothing good awaited their kingdom. Jackson Guard may have been a mighty fighter in top physical shape, a fearmonger in his own right, but ruling a country was not his calling. Jackson Guard felt that this conversation had ruined all his fun. He thought it might be worth it to fire the annoying servant. Just then, another visitor came in. Unlike the squire, he did not hesitate to swing open the door and enter the chambers with determination. He was dressed in a business suit and carried a stack of documents under his arm. Jackson Guard cheerfully greeted Count Keltron, whom he was always happy to see, as he heard compliments from him all the time. Keltron apologized for the sudden intrusion and said that he had been forced to because matters had come up that required the Emperor's attention. Keltron handed Jackson Guard the documents, and the ruler tried to read the scribbles, which were always difficult for him. After spending five minutes trying unsuccessfully to absorb the papers Keltron had brought, he felt irritated. Jackson Guard tossed the papers aside and said he was letting Keltron make his own decisions as he saw fit. Jackson Guard declared that as king he should not be concerned with paperwork, but with the real royal business, the defense of the innocent and the suffering. On the western edge of the capital, from where only the tops of the roofs of the royal palace were visible, there were guests that Jackson Guard had not expected. In front of Shihan and his companions stood a shabby, dilapidated two-story house. It seemed that this shack had seen several generations of people. Alita looked doubtfully at the acquisition, but Shihan said that staying in the inn would be too dangerous. Zeno agreed with the commander's argument, but said he had an objection of a different sort. The knight inside resented that the savior would live in a shabby house, totally unworthy of a hero, and so Zeno was determined to do something about it. Inside, they were greeted by cobwebs, dirt, and peeling paint, but Shihan looked pleased and said everything was better than he'd bargained for. Zenon, who was standing behind him, was silent. But this silence was ringing. Shihan realized that he fundamentally disagreed with something. The knight exclaimed that this house would be a cursed place where Shihan was not allowed to be until Zenon made things right. He ushered Shihan and Alida outside, proceeding to put the house in the proper order Zenon had envisioned it to be. There were violent rustles, creaks and rumbles inside the house, and magical sparks could be seen through the windows. Shihan and Alita were sitting in the courtyard, occasionally looking at each other puzzled and exchanging jokes about how these sounds didn't sound like cleaning. When they went inside in the evening, they couldn't believe their eyes. It was as if Xenon hadn't just cleaned up but had managed to make repairs. Shihan was discouraged by the cleanliness, and Zaino was still lamenting that the house remained shabby and lacked furniture. Listening to Zenon's lamentations that he had missed the dirt somewhere, Alita thought the best way to get Zenon out of the fight was to spit on the floor. Shihan was pleased he tried to reassure Zenon that it was quite good for a start and that he had done an excellent job. He was already anticipating a meeting with Yaxengard, aged in ten years, but still the same rude, narcissistic, handsome man. The feeling that the plan was beginning to come to fruition filled Shahan with triumph, and he called his comrades to make further preparations. The trio gathered in a large room to discuss the way forward. Zeno began to talk about the six kingdoms of Terranor. The states of Lilstein and Anathius were considered wealthy and more powerful than the rest. The kingdoms of Safran and Felos were inferior, but still fairly successful. Jackson Guard and Theorante, on the other hand, were experiencing problems as their rulers were not doing well. Moreover, the states have been in conflict, the most recent being the Cargon War. A dispute between Lilstein and Inathius occurred over claims to ownership of Cargon, but it was settled with the intervention of the other kingdoms. Jackson Guard put forward a formula that would prevent aggression, stating that the others would support the enemy of whoever attacked Cargon. At this expense, Cargon was not harmed, and later disputes over driving rights were resolved diplomatically. Shahan hummed contentedly, pleased with the news that his former allies were not presenting a united front. He told Zeno that his former friends had clearly lost their common sense, and greed for power had blinded their eyes to the point where they had forgotten about friendship. 
Zeno agreed with Shihan and resented how he could only serve for so many years to one of these scoundrels who were scheming against the Savior. Shahan poked Zeno to distract him from these thoughts and reminded him that the Savior was alive, and what's more, he was here. They went to the courtyard where Alida was outdoors practicing magic, or rather the skills Shihan had told her about. Alida was slightly upset. She looked tired, and without her leather protection, she looked like a schoolgirl. The girl tried using magic to change her appearance, but she got something ugly, a face that didn't keep its shape with rough features. Shahan saw that grimace and couldn't help but laugh. Alita admitted that she didn't get out and asked why he was laughing. It seems she didn't look in the mirror. Shihan repeated his instructions that energy with an invisible hand should wrap around the girl's face. He said that skill doesn't change the face, it kind of covers it with makeup that changes the look, and that thin cover and needs to be stabilized. Alita looked at her comrade with a reproachful look, displeasure evident in her voice. She said that he only rambles the same thing, and although he himself is a master in the skill, but explanation is not his outstanding talent. Shihan admitted that he himself didn't understand how he did it, so he could only quote Levina's explanations as she taught others. Alita asked how he had mastered the skill, but Shihan replied that he and Zen and Alas could not use that method. And the reason for that is because Shihan came from Earth, so it's not the same with him as it is with the people of Terranor. People in these two worlds, despite appearances of indistinguishability, perceive magic differently. The people of Terranor have to engage in spiritual practices in order to master their battle energy. It's as if they are wandering through a dark warehouse. The Zemlans, on the other hand, and Shahan among others, are seen in this warehouse, so they can simply walk over and take what they need, master the technique they want. Due to this, it only took Shahan three years to reach the highest possible mastery in martial and magical skills. Alida was angry at such an injustice, and Shihan honestly admitted that he couldn't consider himself a genius for this reason. Shihan added that Lilstein researched this, and it turns out that this effect doesn't just affect Earth. The realignment happens when a portal is passed through. Alita grudgingly remarked that it was unfortunate that some passing through portals bestowed such a forbidding talent. Shihan recognized that he didn't claim the laurels of a good teacher, and she would have to try to learn the technique on her own. He was about to leave, but Alita called out to him, an idea flashing in her eyes. She asked that if you sent a person from Terranor to another world and then brought them back, they would become as strong as Shihan. Shahan realized that he hadn't thought of such an idea before. This girl definitely had a subtle mind and was thinking better than him. The guy replied that in theory it could work, but then their conversation was interrupted by the rumble of boulders falling from a height. All three of them felt a fine vibration coming straight from the ground. They glanced over and Zeno suggested it might be an earthquake, but Shihan said that it wasn't it because he could feel the extraneous energy and it seemed familiar to him, but that would be unbelievable. The tremors grew stronger and buildings in the city began to collapse. There were screams of people who didn't have time to jump out of their houses and fell under the rubble. Some died and some screamed to be pulled out. There were other cries, shrieks of terror that people let out at the sight of huge predatory creatures as tall as houses. Cat faces and huge, sharp fangs did not promise anything good to the average human who found himself dangerously close to them. The creatures resembled something between bears and lions. Their mane was not very pronounced, and their bodies had a more stocky build. Finally, someone shrieked that it was the Leocans and called for a run, but everyone in the vicinity was rushing away as it was. The young girl stumbled and fell, backing away from the others and the Leocans were already at her side. A clawed paw with long fingers was about to grab her. The girl tried to crawl, but it certainly wouldn't save her. In a moment, the figure of a swordsman appeared between the beast and the man, and with a sharp blow, he repelled the predator's paw. Shihan fleetingly threw a question to the girl if she was unharmed and helped her run away from the monsters. Alida and Zenon were side by side with swords at the ready, all three of them perplexed as to how more than 30 creatures had gotten into the thick of the capital. 
Shi Han expressed that there was definitely a catch to this situation, although it was impossible to figure out what it was yet. He said that we would have to sacrifice stealth and fight back against the monsters, otherwise the casualties in the city would be countless. Zeno attacked first. He delivered stabbing blows to the beasts and blood flooded the sidewalk. Shahan and Alida covered him from the flanks to prevent the rest of the Laokans from taking them on. In the heat of battle, the comrades did not notice as they were approached from behind. They were men in armor and with weapons, apparently city guards, and they demanded that the battle cease. Shahan didn't understand what it was about at first and was glad for the reinforcements that were supposed to help stop the monsters. But the knights were in no hurry to rush to their aid and looked sternly at Shu Han and his companions. Then they came up and surrounded them, threatening them with swords. Shahan realized that the guards were not going to fight the monsters. The commander of the guards accused the trio of insubordination. He said that the Dark Lion Knights were in control and demanded that they retreat. Alita asked what the hell was going on and demanded that the knights protect the townspeople, or at least stay out of the way. But the knights demanded that they stop resisting and shut their mouths. They said they were acting according to the will of the king. Zeno asked Shihan, what kind of farce was going on here? But the man shrugged as he didn't know the answer himself. Here he felt with his back that a very important moment was about to come. Shihan turned around, his gaze became rigid, and his entire body tensed up. Behind the knight's backs, the silhouette of a man could already be seen through the flames of the fire in one of the destroyed houses. Shahan could feel this person approaching. Magic couldn't lie, they were well acquainted. Her firm footsteps kicked clouds of dust out of the road. She was confident and commanding. The figure shouted to the beasts that they had dared to attack his people in vain. A broad male torso clad in barbarian armor could be seen through the smoke. Jackson Guard, slinging a huge axe on his shoulder, shouted encouragingly for the people not to be afraid of the monsters because he had come to protect everyone. The Emperor commanded the knights to cover the men while he himself belligerently threatened the monsters. The knights stood in front of the townspeople, closing ranks with their shields outward so that nothing outside could break through. Shahan scrutinized the old acquaintance as he hurried towards the Laokans, trying to notice every detail, every change. Jackson Guard glowered at the monsters, shouting to the beasts that his body had managed to lose its shape without fighting, as if the beasts cared. The Emperor let out a war cry that promised death to the Leokans, and with huge axes in each hand, made an attacking leap. Upon seeing these axes, the people let out an admiring murmur. Few had seen such a mighty warrior in action. The Leokans were taking crushing damage, Jackson Guard chopping chunks off of them with a single blow. As he laughed in battle, feeling his complete superiority, the blood that ran down his armor was like a natural element of attire for him. Sensing this onslaught, the Lokans flattened their ears and whimpered cowardly, scurrying down the street. The monsters tried to run away, but it seems Jackson Guard decided not to give them a chance to return. Fleeing only filled him with contempt for these creatures. He shouted an insult at them in their wake, then stomped his mighty foot in a wrought iron boot, as if demanding that the Leokans return to his leg like trained dogs. But that leg kick was just the beginning of the execution of a powerful technique. A circle of light flashed beneath Yaxengard. Beams erupted from it, rushing across the ground. Zeno whispered in excitement, that it was a battle seal that he had only heard of, but had never seen until now. Alita asked what the battle seal was, and Zanon told her that it was a skill only available to swordsmen with the rank of master. The battle seal was a type of magic seal. It utilized the warrior's battle energy. Jackson Guard shouted one last threat into the backs of the fleeing Leocans and waved his fist. It was the final movement. After him, the battle seal giant's hand released its destructive energy and caught up with the monsters, bringing death to them. The people rejoiced at such a spectacular victory that demonstrated the might of their ruler and his ability to protect them from terrible enemies. Alita looked at it with horror. She had never seen such fighting techniques before. Xenon had a look of envy in his eyes. Shihan looked skeptical as usual. His mind was putting the puzzle together in his head at this time, 
he felt even more disgusted with Jacksongard. Jacksongard triumphed and waved to the people as he stood on the carcass of the defeated Leocon, and only Shihan knew that it was a set-up performance. The sudden appearance of the monsters in the city, the guards pushing them out of the Emperor's way, all for the sake of creating an image, but the plan seemed too devious. Jackson Guard's face was genuinely cheerful. Shihan remembered him as a man with firm ideals who would not fall for treacherous deceit. Something didn't add up. The fact that it was a production was obvious. But what was the role of the Emperor, Shihan doubted. If Jackson Guard had planned the whole affair, he could hardly have been so good at feigning holy ignorance. The Emperor basked in the people's love, it was another way for him to stroke his ego as a ruler. Sheehan realized that this moron really believed that monsters randomly appeared and that he had saved everyone. The naive rich man who thinks he runs everything in this kingdom was smiling now, unaware that he had become a puppet of someone in his retinue. Sheehan thought that it would be more dignified if he was actually one of the organizers of this intrigue. But it seems that simplicity bordering on stupidity has played a cruel trick on Jackson Guard. Jackson Guard looked around at the cheering crowd, but his gaze lingered on Shukan, who was standing there, not sharing in the excitement. Sheehan thought he was recklessly staring at the Emperor, openly expressing how different he was. Jackson Guard sensed that the man he met his gaze with wasn't just an average citizen, but he didn't recognize his former friend. He hesitated trying to tease out an image that stubbornly didn't want to surface. He was distracted by one of the guards, suggesting that he return to the palace as the threat to the city had passed, and the emperor absent-mindedly agreed. He decided that if he didn't remember something, it was no great misfortune, and to the delighted shouts of the crowd, he withdrew, accompanied by the knights. Sheehan thought a little sadly that even after ten years, Yaxengard was still stupid, but extremely strong and sturdy in body. He decided that they were still not strong enough for an open confrontation, and careful preparation was necessary. The capital lived its life, day after day passed, uttering with it to the inhabitants the usual routine. In ten days, Alida was still able to master the skill of a thousand looks of an empress, and could now change her appearance. Zainan was told by Shihan about the mountain destruction technique he had created. Shihan's weak teaching credentials were compensated for by Zainan's diligence. Shihan himself was always increasing the amount of combat and magic energy available to him. All this time they had been biding their time, waiting for something that would make it easier for them to defeat Yaxengard. And then one day the opportunity came, a big poster was put up in the town square, and a lot of people gathered around it. The poster announced a recruitment drive for a squad that would defeat the pagans who had settled near the city and were channeling demons from there. The trio of heroes were also interested in the poster, but couldn't get close due to the crowd. Shihan asked what the heathens were, and Zeno tried to read it. Shihan knew that back in the time of the previous emperor, there were groups of fanatics who believed that there was a god named Heros who lived in another world. Zeno said that the previous heathens were suppressed long ago, but these ones have a new doctrine. As the poster said, Shirhan snorted disdainfully. However, when Zeno said that the new pagans believed in the second coming of the Savior, Shirhan suddenly became serious. He immediately became much more curious and asked again, to which Zeno read that the heathens believed Shikan to be the son of Heros, who would punish Terenor. Allegedly, Shukan was supposed to take everyone to reign on Earth. But the current evil rulers prevented that from happening, which is partly true, Zeno added. Shahan thought that whatever strange things were going on here after he left, but this trek might be to their advantage. After all, this kind of mission to suppress dissenters Jackson Guard, knowing his character, would lead personally. And if the trio of heroes also take part in the campaign, Getting close to the Emperor will be much easier than making your way to his palace. On the day the trek began, the volunteers gathered in the square from where they were to move out in an organized manner. A man much smaller than Jackson Guard rode out in front of the men on a horse. He introduced himself as Earl Keltron and said he would be leading the march. 
Alita asked herself who this person was and why he would be in charge, and Shi Han just leaned over disappointedly and shook his head. His expectations were not met, and Shi Han felt that they had embarked on a difficult and long trek that would be of no use. But he regained his spirits with the thought that the trek might yield some information, but the question of where Yaxengard was remained open. Sheehan didn't know what it had taken for Keltrin to convince the Emperor not to take part in the campaign when he was burning with righteous anger to exterminate the heathens. Keltrin himself wasn't thrilled to be a part of this. After all, he wasn't a fighter, but a palace aristocrat. But Emperor Lilstein's envoy urged that the truth be concealed from Yaxengard and his knights. Keltrin was sure he could pull this off behind his Emperor's back, as he had done so many times before taking advantage of his indifference. Lilstein's envoy was Trandon, with whom he had long made favorable deals, directing Yaxengard's policies for a good reward. Trandon had promised reinforcements of ten ivory tower mages and five knights. Keltrin was only required to recruit a militia. Keltrin's job was to subdue the heathens with militia forces, and the mages and knights would accomplish their mission on their own under that cover. A large procession led by Keltrin emerged from the city gates and staggered down the road toward the forest. The preacher called out to the crowd gathered in front of a fire stacked at the entrance to the huge cave. He proclaimed that the non-believers in the second coming have organized an armed campaign against the true believers and now this troop is coming here. The preacher reminded that death is not to be feared because it is the way to paradise and godless fools simply do not realize this. He smiled at the crowd, showing his joy, welcoming death as deliverance and trying to convey that feeling to the others. The preacher also reminded that suicide cannot serve as a pathway to paradise as it contradicts the teachings of heroes. Instead, we need to help others get to heaven, he finished, and called for the volunteers who had been selected for today's ritual. Three figures stepped forward, two men and one very young girl, the muffled cloaks of all the cult members concealing their appearance. The preacher approached each one and blessed them with the name of Heros, inspiring them to sacrifice. The girl answered the priest with childlike delight. The preacher's name was Lactrin, and she told him in a voice full of sincerity that she was not afraid. Lactrin only gave her a silent smile if it weren't for the setting. It might have seemed like he was literally radiating kindness. Finally, the priest spread his arms and began the ritual. He called to the dragon, sent by Heros, to accept the sacrifice. The three chosen ones stared into the darkness of the cave, awaiting their fate. One of the men broke out in a cold sweat, and the girl seemed mesmerized. A dragon's head appeared from the cave. It hovered at a height of half a dozen meters and looked over the crowd in front of the entrance. The dragon's head had thorns sticking out to form a crown, and behind it was a long, stocky neck and a mighty, large torso. The Chosen Ones were ecstatic at the sight of the giant, and the other cultivators were also ecstatic. The girl couldn't stand it and shouted a request to the dragon to accept their loyalty as a gift to Heros. It didn't take long for the dragon to come, jaws clacking three times, jets of blood splattered in different directions, and that was all that was left of the Chosen Ones. The crowd of cultivators cheered. They let out an unintelligible roar of approval. The dragon turned around, showing its thick tail, and disappeared into the cave, while the preacher proclaimed that Heros had blessed his loyal servants for the fight. As the cultists turned around and went to prepare for battle, Lactran exhaled, satisfied that everything was going according to plan. Only the magic remedy in his pouch was running out too fast, and he didn't like that. The remedy was made from the ashes of the hearts of members of the Laxlan family, and it was this, combined with sacrifices, that gave Lactran power over the dragon. Sooner or later, however, the ashes would run out and the dragon would no longer be usable, but Lactran had not yet decided how he would maintain faith in his words. Still, for now, the dragon was in his power, and he could afford much, even knowing that then all his power would dissipate. Toward evening, a detachment of townspeople emerged from the forest to the edge of the forest, where there was a flat, stony ground framed by thick bushes. The knights thought it was a convenient place to camp and declared a parking lot, 
instructing everyone to pitch their tents. The men recruited in the city, unaccustomed to camping, hung around the future camp, not really caring about organizing a night's lodging and keeping an eye on the forest. Zeno resented that this rabble was worthless compared to the mouthed soldiers. He dreaded to imagine these men in battle. Alita sneered that as a noble knight, he had seen nothing but the army and therefore was not aware of the life of ordinary mercenaries. Zeno didn't understand her jab, so he replied that it wasn't her place to talk about nobility given her lineage. He and the girl had already turned menacingly toward each other, but Shihan admonished the knight that he shouldn't talk among other people's ears. It would be difficult to plausibly explain what Zeno meant, and the boy, realizing his gaffe, rushed to apologize. Shihan pacified him and suggested that he just eat because he was hungry and it was proper to maintain his strength. Zeno rejoiced at the suggestion, primarily because he rushed to prepare dinner for his commanding officer. While Zenon was busily fiddling with the wok, Shuhan asked Alita if they were going to eat stew again. Alita admonished that the stew was very nutritious, which was vital for a soldier, and also quick and easy to prepare, but Shuhan already knew that. He was getting bored with the stew and wanted something tasty, to which Alita said that food was needed to maintain strength, not for flavor. While the boy and girl were arguing, they didn't notice Zeno announcing that everything was ready for the meal. The comrades approached the cauldron and saw a beautiful stew that literally radiated with appetizing deliciousness. After tasting one spoonful, Shihan marveled and asked if Zenon had used the usual ingredients, but Alita silently nibbled on it. Zenon replied that there was nothing special about this stew, and he made such a stew out of habit because cooking had become his hobby. The flavors of the dish rose to the night sky, white clouds floating across it, the company around the fire debating whether Zeno was really a knight or a cook. Alita soon asked for more, and Zenon gladly poured her another portion. He was pleased with the high praise from his friends. Shahan, on the other hand, enjoyed looking at this picture of friendly appeasement. It was so much better than when they were poking each other. But the evening managed to spoil in an instant when a drop fell on Shihan's top, followed by dozens of others. The starry sky darkened and rain poured from the clouds. The crowns of the surrounding trees rustled. It became uncomfortable very quickly. The militiamen have started to put up their tents and the camp is in a frenzy. Keltron grumbled that it was awful to be outside in the rain, though he was in the night's tent, set up in advance and completely dry. Shahan was also trying to help the tent, and Zeno, hinting that he had warned, replied that it would be hard to see anything with water pouring around. Alita asked that since the cultists were putting demons on their enemies, at least they didn't have to fear an attack, since demonic beasts didn't like rain. Zeno noticed that while everyone was scrambling around trying to organize their shelter, the camp was practically defenseless, with no one watching the forest. Shahan confidently replied in a coy tone that no matter who controlled the monsters, they were still animals, and their instincts could not be suppressed. So the demons can't be forced to attack them when it rains, Shihan concluded, which pleased Zeno. Here, Shihan listened and mockingly said that the demons had attacked after all. Adding to the commotion of the men in the camp was the panic flight. Many left without weapons as they hurriedly hid them under the sheds. From the forest, under the cover of the sound of the rain, unbelievable shapes of giant creatures like a mixture of toads, fish, crabs, and forest beasts were coming out. Shihan, who had once again sat in a puddle, asked in a weak voice if things had changed so much in Terranor in ten years. But the mages looking out of the tent were also whispering in a puzzled manner, because to force the monsters to attack in the rain could only be forced by prohibitive control. A knight who entered interrupted their banter and commanded them to join the others and assume a battle formation to respond to the attack. Someone experienced from the militia with a crooked dagger snuck up to one of the monsters and confident that the beast in front of him was a foolish beast after all, conducted a deceptive attack. This militiaman was clearly a former mercenary. He had an eye patch and he acted skillfully. Under the cover of the night, he slit open the demon's belly and it fell to the ground and collapsed. One-eyed sensed victory, looking around for his next opponent. 
but it proved to be rash, for the monster only briefly lost its strength, it swung its paw, and the mercenary rolled on the ground. The militia, who had already managed to take down several of the monsters, did not understand why the demons were being unusually persistent for beasts. There was a voice saying that they were too well controlled, so each demon would fight to the death. It was Shi Han he commanded to focus his attacks on the nearest demons to quickly and guaranteed to incapacitate them. He directed the ranks of the militia and ran with them to dispense instructions on the spot. One of the knights turned to another named Jules Darren and remarked that Shi Han looked interesting, to which the other said that he could be useful. Jules watched Shi Han's actions and had already decided what kind of errand he would give him. Shi Han rushed towards the monster his gaze focused and his movements precise. He had managed to get himself a second sword and was now striking with double the frequency, energizing one of the swords. A few blows and the monstrous lizard collapsed to the ground, tongue out on the ground, its dead eye staring into the sky. Questions from the militia were heard asking if this was really the last monster. People were catching their breath and wiping the blood from their faces. Finally, after inspection, it became clear that the enemies were over, and the camp was overcome with jubilation, the warriors raising their weapons into the air. Sheehan carefully counted the corpses of the monsters. There were 44 of them, which meant that if the intelligence information was to be believed, they were all the demons of the cult. He was still trying to search his memory for a clue as to who and how could control demons so tightly, but such a thing had never happened even in Luslanad's time. His keen eye caught a cluster of people near one of the tents. Without giving any sign, he began to watch and realized that the group of mages who had been assigned to support the squad were bantering about something. The mages looked agitated and didn't seem to share everyone's joy. Shihan realized that the sectarians were a cover because it was no longer difficult for their squad to cover a gang of unarmed people. Keltron, impressed by the demon attack, was now meticulously walking around the camp and threatening everyone that anyone who let their guard down would be punished. The militia behind his back grumbled about how this grief-stricken commander was cowardly hiding behind their backs, with the knights playing the role of personal guards. Zeno shared this opinion. He had felt contempt for Keltron after the fight, and Alita agreed with the knight. Shehan suggested to just ignore that person because that person is always acting selfish. Zeno was surprised and asked if Shihan knew Keltron, to which the guy replied that he knew it from rumors. There was a saying about Keltron that he was a man with the body of a wise man and the mind of a beast. Zeno took the praise as a compliment and was beginning to think that Keltron was worth something. But Shihan pointed out that it was a joke and that this count was as dumb as an animal and as weak as an old man. And at the conclusion of this characterization, he added that the only thing that could be counted as a talent was a roach-like survivability. Zeno agreed that the world was an amazing place since such people managed to have the title of Count. But Alita, who had been listening silently until now, disagreed. She said that there was probably some benefit from Keltron, unknown to them, to someone important since he was given a high position. The detachment dismounted and by the next evening reached the village of Zard, where the men were able to comfortably camp for the night. In the hall of the local town hall, Keltron gave a rousing speech of thanks to the men and announced that tomorrow they would fulfill their task. The militiamen were glad to get a good dinner and soft beds, so tomorrow seemed easy and cloudless. Sheehan looked at this and recalled to his comrades that just yesterday, the militia was still grumbling to the command, Alida and Zenon were arranging the mattresses on the floor at this time. Shihan laid down on his own and contentedly suggested to his comrades that they rest at ease, now that the opportunity had presented itself. At this moment, someone called out Sean Stein, and Shihan opened his eyes with an expression as if he was ready to start killing again. A high girlish voice Nova asked if Sean Stein was in the audience, a young girl with red hair wearing a crested cape stood in the doorway. Shihan called back to her and waved his hand for the looking girl to notice where the voice came from. That one came up and introduced herself as Dinah Crumble, 
Knight Foreman's apprentice, and then asked Shai Han to go with her because he was expected. The three companions glanced around. Something interesting was coming up, so they rose to their feet all together. The knights were seated in a separate house with richer finishes, similar to a tavern. The girl led the company to the door, but said she had to warn them of their arrival first, because there might be secret conversations going on inside. She furtively glanced at Alita with genuine interest and poorly concealed envy. Alita noticed this attention, but didn't understand what it was about, so she only looked back questioningly. In fact, the knight's apprentice saw that Alita wasn't much older than her, but already had a high rank, and she imbued the swordswoman with admiration. Finally, they were allowed inside, and Shi Han, having changed his appearance beforehand, walked into the knight's room and asked why they were looking for him. The nearest knight introduced himself as Jolderin, and the mage standing next to him as Habark, the knight showing friendliness while the mage looked aloof. Jolderun invited Shihan and his companions to look at the geographical map. It marked their location and also where the cultists were located. The knight said that it was half a day's journey to the target. Habark revealed that cultists had the ability to control demonic monsters, something that Shihan could notice yesterday. Zenon noted that this was the first time the monsters had attacked while it was raining, and it was a very remarkable moment. The mage wondered if any of the militia had noticed it yet, and how much it surprised them. After receiving the reply that the others were not as knowledgeable about the demon's habits and had not noticed the oddity, Habark asked if the friends could keep it a secret. Shehan took advantage of the situation and immediately asked what they would get for it. It was a good move, for their selfish motives masked the real ones. Habark was pleased with this turn, as the businessman was easy to get along with. He smiled demurely. Ten gold coins were placed on the table as payment for silence. Zeno marveled at the price of the secret, and the thought of selling his underpants flashed through Shihan's mind again, but he reminded himself that this was an exception. Therefore, Shihan also quite agreed and piled the coins into his wallet. The mage's face took on an impassive expression again, and he hinted that what was said next was also not meant for other people's ears. Habark said that up until a certain time, the cultists didn't have demon control magic. All they had was sacrifices. In the world of Terranor, besides magic, which was akin to science and gave precise results, there was also chaotic sorcery at random with sacrifice. Shihan asked, wondering if the demons could be brought under control with unpredictable sorcery. But the magician objected that the source of the control had to do with a shameful political history. The fact that this spell was deliberately developed in the Blue Tower, hearing this fact, Shihan was surprised and his interest increased. Habark told about Lactrin Proud, a talented wizard who was doing secret research on the sixth floor. However, his arrogance failed him and the demonic monsters broke free. It was a fatal mistake. Lactran was stripped of all titles and sentenced to a four-element punishment. Zeno asked again, as he hadn't heard of it before, to which the mage replied that it involved the four elements and was essentially a death sentence. Zeno asked indignantly if they had gone overboard with the punishment for a single mistake. Habark replied sharply that a mere mercenary like him should not judge matters that did not concern him. Zeno realized he shouldn't have made this man angry, lest the conflict inadvertently cause them to reveal themselves, so he scattered apologies. The mage demanded that they finish listening, as they were already being told only what was necessary. Lactrin unknowingly managed to escape before the execution, and one of the test monsters he took with him. It was not an easy monster, it possessed the skill of controlling other demons. Shehan was now riddled with the realization that drove the demonic creatures who were steadily marching thou rain or shine to their deaths. It also turned out that Lactran's father was a priest of the cult, and so this beast had fallen into their service, which is why the cult had risen so much recently. Jul'Duran, who had been silent until then, finished by saying that destroying the beast and covering their tracks was the goal of the campaign, and Shikan seemed capable of doing so. Shihan was very flattered by this, he joked in return that with mages and knights they could even kill a dragon. 
The magician still replied just as dispassionately that Shihan had guessed, and a smile froze on his lips. An earth dragon was in the hands of the cultists, and this creature had to be destroyed. Shihan realized that the task was not an easy one. He needed to think hard about how they could accomplish it. The trio made their way out to the river to wash a change of clothes while being able to discuss matters away from prying ears. Shihan said he wasn't surprised by the gold reward since the opponent was so serious, and Zenon, seeing his worries, asked if he could refuse. Shihan replied that now that they knew the secret of the Blue Tower after successfully completing the task, they might try to eliminate them. Zeno and Alita looked at their comrade in surprise, waiting for this thought to continue. Shihan thought that it was as if they were naive children for living in this fairy tale world. But then Alita objected confidently, and a surprised Shihan looked at her, wanting to hear where she got that from. Alita replied that the sorcerer got angry when Zeno asked why the punishment for Lactran was so severe, meaning something was being kept from them. Besides, even if the mages were going to kill them, they still had no need to reveal secrets. One could only give orders. Zanin was glad that Alita noticed his move in the dialogue, and the woman replied that she wasn't a village idiot. Shihan felt ashamed of his arrogance. Zeno asked Shihan if they would fulfill the assignment given by the mage. The one replied that he hadn't decided yet, but the mage had no idea that he was communicating secrets to people with his own interest, and it might help to get closer to Yaxengard. Zeno kept trying to get the commander to wash his clothes and at least hang them out to dry. People approached the friends from behind. The knight casually turned around and flinched. What he saw startled him, causing Shihan to throw a glance behind him as well. A group of cheerful women with laundry were hurrying towards them. When the women saw that they had been spotted, they began to gallop about, addressing the guys on the shore. When they came up close, they pounced with questions about where such handsome men had come from, whether they were comfortable at their post in the village, and other nonsense. Zeno agreed with the women's chastisement that it was imperative to gain strength before leaving, and hurriedly said a polite goodbye, leading his friends away. When they stepped back, he exhaled in relief and whispered a complaint that the situation was awkward, even though the villagers were very welcoming. As they left, the trio didn't see these same women staring back at them with unkind looks and only doing their laundry for the sake of appearances. A dagger gleamed in the sun, which a woman's hand retrieved from a pile of rags. With a burst of speed, she rushed after her friends as they left, weapon raised to strike. Alita, who was walking last, heard the approaching stomping, turned around, and instantly oriented herself. It was enough for the villager to go flying down the road as Alita remained firmly on her feet and had already made a stand. The boys, seeing the woman roll past them, turned around in incomprehension and saw an even more amazing sight. A group of women approached them with knives, their faces twisted with rage, and their lips whispering curses to all unbelievers. Shehan asked if Alita had a premonition of a catch that she reacted so quickly, but she said she didn't suspect anything. But then added that she didn't suspect anything special, because she was used to suspecting all people and always being wary. Shehan imagined his friend's thoughts as she chatted with smiling women while she herself held the option of a knife in her back. The guys shouted to the women that life was definitely better than death, even if it was the boring life of a villager. The villagers didn't want to listen to them. They hissed that death offered true salvation. It was like they were drugged. Letting out a cry that the heretics must die, the women rushed to attack. They themselves were like the demonic monsters in the forest the day before. Alita shouted to her comrades that the women had strange eyes, noticing the resemblance. Ten seconds later, all the villagers were already scattered around unconscious and the three comrades were looking around at this carnage. Shahan said that they were definitely not berserk, just crazy broads. He wondered why the assassination attempt was organized specifically on them when they should be considered ordinary mercenaries and there were higher priority targets. When Alita pointed her finger towards the village, Shahan and Zenon looked where the girl was pointing and saw reddish reflections. Columns of smoke were rising from the other side, it looked like the village was engulfed in fires. Soon ash began to fall from the sky. 
Shi Han immediately couldn't believe what was happening, but he realized that they weren't particularly targeted. Instead, their entire squad was attacked. The lad was angry that they had split off from the others doing some ridiculous laundry, for the squad could have already suffered casualties in the village. That's when it occurred to him that the cultists didn't come to the village. They were the villagers. Their unit had voluntarily come to the trap. Groups of villagers with pitchforks and scythes ran through the streets in search of the militia, their crazed faces twisted with bloodlust. Meanwhile, Jolderan raced down the street, picking apart any enemies that came his way. The fanatics were dying with tears of joy in their eyes, jubilant that they were going to their god, but the knight didn't care about their emotions. He only looked back contemptuously at the next madman, amazed at how stupefied they were. A rumbling sound was heard ahead. It was clearly not cultists. Jolderan grouped up to deflect the blow. Breaking through fences, a demonic bull as tall as a house rushed at him. Jolderan made no move to escape or dodge. It turned out that, in addition to the fanatics, monsters were also active in the city. The knight began a ritual to finish off the nearest one. He used the iron wall technique, and the bull with all its might slammed into the shield of purple light that had grown in front of the knight. Two more knights came to the rescue, one rushing on the ground, the other making a combat leap. This second one landed on the bull from above, using the annihilation technique and inflicting massive damage to the beast. However, the knights immediately saw more monsters coming out from behind the houses. They didn't understand where they had gotten so many of them at the cult's disposal. Habark, who had joined Jolderan, informed him that the demons seemed to have shaved off seemingly the entire mountain, and the knight realized that the area of control was simply gigantic. Jolderan asked if the dragon was older than 500 years, because if so, they were doomed. But Habark replied that the dragon was only a century old. He explained that the dragon's abilities were disproportionately strong due to magical experiments on it. Jolderan rudely said that it didn't matter if it was because of age that this thing was so strong or some other reason. But Habark hastened to reassure him that the dragon's power had only increased in the area of its control talents, and its physical strength and survivability had not changed. One of the knights reprimanded and shouted to the others to look along the street. The monsters, which included a mantis and a bear, were heading towards the tavern where the squad's goofy squad leader Keltron was hiding. The bear punched through the front wall of the building with a paw strike and half crawled into a room on the first floor. Keltron squeezed into the wall, shaking like an aspen leaf. The two girl students with swords continued to cover them, though they were completely confused. Keltron screamed in terror, himself resembling a wench. He rebuked the knights for promising him safety in this tavern. He resented the knights leaving him here while they went to mop up the streets and demanded the girls rescue him immediately. The red-haired Dinah overcoming her fear approached the demonic bear with her sword drawn, expecting to strike at any moment. Suddenly, a blue ray flashed nearby which reeked of overwhelming power. Shahan, with two swords emitting light, appeared between the girl and the bear. Crossing his blades, he directed the power of the magic strike at the monster. Dina felt delighted and relieved. Behind Shihan's back, she felt safe. Alida and Zenon appeared at once and deftly struck the bear, cutting it to pieces. Jolderan ran up to Shikan. He thanked Shikan for his help and asked if he had seen the others. Shikan said there was fighting going on all over the village. Jolderan assigned him to guard Keltron and promised to take care of the monsters with the Black Lion Knights. The shrill voice of an aristocrat was heard from behind, ordering that Shihan should take over his guard. But even that pig squeal couldn't drown out a distant and deafening but very powerful sound. Shihan realized that something truly large was moving in the village, compared to which even the demons were of mediocre size. Somewhere on a nearby street, a green clawed paw descended to the ground, leaving a dent underneath. The dragon's head, far above the houses, and even the mill, looked over the village, and it was as plain as the palm of the monster's hand. Crimson clouds filled with smoke and ash floated over the village, the fires rising towards them as if trying to reach out and deal with them. Jolderan finished the fight, 
In front of him lay another giant demonic bear many times larger than the one that had attacked the tavern. He shouted words of encouragement to the other knights. The monsters that seemed incalculable until then were almost over. Keltron tormented Shihan with his arrogant ramblings while the boy listened, trying to determine at least by sound the dynamics of the battle. He counted the death screams of the monsters and realized that most of them had not been killed, which meant they had simply escaped back into the forest. The mages fighting side by side with the knights gave a startled cry. They were the first to see a monster they had never fought before. The knights turned around and curses came out of their mouths, the only way the brave warriors could express consternation without losing their honor. Strength was running low, and the brief joy of defeating the demon hordes evaporated when the black silhouette of a dragon's head loomed like a living tower. The dragon's eyes were burning. He was ravenously searching for his victims. Soon all these insignificant creatures would feel the power of his fury if they had time to realize it before they died. The dragon opened its mouth and let out a low, whistling howl, similar to the cry of a monstrous seagull. The knights organized the group. The mages stepped forward. They were to maintain the squad's defenses. The dragon opened its mouth, but this time to release a tight jet of fire several meters thick. The mages put up special water shields in front of the squad that were supposed to neutralize the flames. One of the knights exhaled reassuringly because the dragon's power hadn't increased due to the experiments, and they had enough strength to cope. However, there was a complicating factor. Everyone was already tired after a long battle with demons. Julderan reprimanded Haybark for downplaying the problem with his appeasement speeches. He pointed to the blazing village, showing that the dragon could still bring back its monsters, and Haybark said that the power of control could still grow a bit. Julderan scolded with desperation, as they had no way to force a fight on the dragon on their terms. Finally, he realized that all that remained was to encourage his fellow soldiers to give their best, and he raised his sword arm upwards. The dragon, seeing that the fire attack had not dared his tiny opponents, stomped off in their direction. Jolderan stepped forward, shield out. Now it was up to him to hold off the onslaught. The knight once again used the iron wall technique to besiege the dragon. Immediately after that, he used the destruction technique to strike the dragon with crushing power. The other knights, seeing their comrades single-handedly confronting the most powerful monster, were encouraged and rushed to help. They put up their shields of magical energy and stood side by side so that the shields formed a solid line. Zeno marveled at what was happening. Unique fighting techniques were used here. The dragon couldn't move the formation one bit. Shahan, on the other hand, saw the knight's tactics as the style of Yaxengard, who liked frontal attacks, always ensuring that his strike was stronger. He remembered how the rest of his former comrades always freaked out when, Instead of cleverly defeating an opponent, Yaxengard overpowered him by body-slamming him. Here, Shihan had an idea. Since the knights were fighting according to Jacksonguard's doctrine, it meant that he was still limited by his style, and this could be his weakness. Shihan smiled contentedly. He was confident that he had found the key to a future victory. But enough was enough thinking, Shihan decided to move out with his friends to help, anticipating that the knights wouldn't be able to do it alone. Keltron raised a cry that he would be left unguarded and that keeping him safe was an order. Shihan replied sharply that if the knights lost, the dragon would get to him and Keltron as well, to which he demanded that they cover his retreat. Zeno felt a fit of disgust for the man, and Alita only said that they could see the animal's mind at work. Keltron raged louder and louder, Shihan's patience was coming to an end. He was torn between two necessities. The friends glanced around. Someone suggested giving Keltron a smack on the head to make him pass out, and the others immediately agreed. Shahan took a sharp step towards the Count, but his facial expression seemed to give away his intentions. Keltron recoiled and said he could see the mercenary's desire to attack him. He pushed Shahan and Zenon toward the door, threatening that he would otherwise report them for disobedience. But at that moment, the squeals stopped, bringing relief to everyone, a puzzled expression frozen on Keltron's face. 
he collapsed to the floor like a sandbag, and the girl standing there with a piece of board in her hand snidely asked where the splinter could have come from. Dinah joked that they had the perfect offense and suggested that everyone run to the aid of the knights as their duty demanded. Sheehan smiled radiantly at the girl, grateful for this favor. The knights ceaselessly chopped with their swords, smoke mixed with dust forming a dense cloud around them, but the dragon was unable to do any damage. The fighters were so tired that they were almost falling off their feet. One of them, Livelle, was reacting too slowly due to fatigue, and the dragon's paw rose above him to stomp him into the ground. The knight had time to hear the warning and dodge, but the blow to the ground was so strong that he and the mages standing nearby were flung apart. Yuldaren saw Lival fall to the ground unconscious, and the dragon looking ravenously over his body. Flames swirled in the dragon's mouth, heralding another jet of fire. Sheehan's team arrived just in time. Alita and Xenon slashed at the dragon's tilted mouth from both sides, and Sheehan grabbed Livelle and dragged him away. A cry of relief burst from Jolderan's chest. How he was glad to see this mercenary, who more than once appeared at just the right moment. After hiding Livelle, Sheehan ran up to Jolderan and said that Keltrin hit his head on the rubble so they could help in the fight. The knight grinned. Alita was nearby. Blood was pouring from her left hand. Shihan was scared for his friend and rushed over to ask if she was all right. Alita reassured him that it was nothing serious with his arm. It was just that the dragon was too hard. Shihan shouted to the knights that they wouldn't be able to do anything while the dragon was covered in natural armor, so they needed to peel off its scales. But the fight took an unexpected turn again. Shihan saw the dragon behaving strangely. It appeared that the titan panicked. He spun around, ignoring the knights and missing the blows aimed at him. Very quickly, he turned around and rushed with all his legs out of the village towards the mountain, puzzling everyone in the battle. A silent scene hung. Alita froze with her wounded hand. Shihan thought it was unlikely the dragon was frightened by his abrupt sentence, as he could not know the language. Alita shyly suggested that maybe the dragon was scared shitless of blood since her wound scared him so much. A few hours later, when the smoke of the fires had cleared, the sky was clear again, and the rays of the setting sun could be seen in it. The captured cultists tied up in the barn angrily shouted curses and threats towards the non-believers. One of them shouted to the militia on guard that Shihan would come back and save them, to which Shihan thought that he definitely wouldn't. He assumed that the expedition against the cult was virtually over, for the bulk of them had been either killed or captured. Keltrin had no recollection of how he'd passed out, and the knight's apprentices had visited him in the hastily constructed hospital. Alita asked what they had been doing here for three days if the cult had been crushed and its leaders had fled. To this, Shehan replied that it was useful to neutralize this group of fanatics, but the unfulfilled goal was the reason why the knights and mages were here. It was unclear where Lactran and his monstrous dragon were. On a calm and clear day, the horrors they faced seemed unreal. However, in the thicket of the forest, in a cave where there were no longer any cultists left and the ritual fire had long since been extinguished, dark things were happening. Lactran was covered in cold sweat. He couldn't get the dragon back under his control no matter what he did. The dragon curled up in a ball in the depths of the cave and stared unfriendly at the annoying human. Lactran shouted at the dragon. He even dared to get close to its mouth and accept that he only beat it with his fists, trying to make it move. He couldn't imagine what had happened four days ago, that the dragon he needed so badly after that had hidden in a cave and stopped responding. Lactrin cursed the mages of the Blue Tower, if only they hadn't condemned him to death for a single oversight. He dreamed of being like this dragon himself and subjugating everyone his will could reach. Lactrin had already amassed wealth by collecting offerings from the cult and could afford a luxurious life if it weren't for the need to hide. The former preacher took out his last resort, the ashes of the hearts of the Laxlan clan, and scattered it near the dragon giving the command to destroy the troop. But the ash had no effect. The dragon no longer reacted to it. Lactran ignited the ashes with magical fire. The flames surged upward, reaching the dragon lightly. 
Again, there was no response. Lactran threw the afterburned ashes on the floor in frustration. Nothing was working. But then the dragon stirred, and the mage fearfully wondered if it was the belated result of the ritual. The dragon rose higher and higher. Lactran, unable to move, simply stood before the monster that now possessed an unpredictable will. Terror seized the former preacher, for he himself had never believed that death brought deliverance. He knew it was pain followed by emptiness. Lactran refused to believe that everything had gone to shit. The magic couldn't have left him that much. A blue light flashed on the dragon's nose, a strange mark of unknown origin. The beast opened its mouth, a long, sharp tongue wavering in it. It was as if a blue star was burning on the dragon's muzzle. Puffs of smoke began to come out of its throat. It looked at Lactran unflinchingly and was completely free. The mage huddled in a corner of the cave. He began to plead with the dragon, begging it to listen. Lactran screamed exhaustedly at the last moment. Inevitability was closing in on him, and he knew what it looked like from the outside. What happened was, what has happened many times to select fanatics, blood spurted in different directions. The dragon headed away from the cave, leaving the disheveled body lying in darkness and oblivion. After a while, Juldren and Habark reached the cave, their voices echoing under the vaults. They expected to encounter demons, but the place was empty. Juldren suggested that they had simply been outnumbered, and Habark replied that if so, that would be a great relief. The mage started to say something, but abruptly interrupted as he heard the crunch of bushes behind him. The count appeared next to the cave, looking around. Habark asked Jolderan in a whisper what the hell he was doing here. They bantered about how Keltrin shouldn't know anything about the dragon's origins, and the earl spotted the figures and strode in their direction. He again expressed his resentment that his guards were not large enough and that he required more knights. Jolderan didn't know how to appease this squabbling man so he wouldn't interfere with their mission. Gathering his composure into a fist, he even explained, not very rudely, that the knights were needed for the battle with the dragon and the count should make do with mercenaries. Keltron disagreed, and the knight, flaring with anger, replied that since the earl wanted knights, then let him go with them to find the dragon. Keltron suddenly agreed he was willing to do anything to be under the cover of the knights. Jolderan was taken aback. He hadn't seriously made the suggestion, nor had he imagined how he and Keltron would load up for a dangerous task. Keltron also felt rushed, for when the knights found the dragon, there was sure to be a battle with it. He began to agonizingly weigh which option seemed the least scary, and in the end, he confirmed that he wanted to stay with the knights. Jolderan would have been ready to punch him if it hadn't been an important person with whom his superiors did political business. A while later, Shikan and his companions reached the cave. He asked Jolderan if it was definitely the same cave, the knight confirmed. Jolderan said that it was found out in the interrogation with confession magic, but Shihan saw that it was just ordinary magic at first. The mages cast typical spells on the captives, but it didn't work on the burned-out madmen. And then the mages used an unfamiliar black powder that had an instant effect. Sheehan thought that perhaps this powder was just related to the secret experiments. Alita suddenly felt something. A chill ran down her back. She looked carefully into the darkness of the cave. Two huge predatory eyes lit up inside, bloodlust like a wave pouring out of the hole in the rock. Yulderen, who had recently explored the cave with Haybark, was almost caught off guard, but he commanded the knights to form up. He himself prepared himself as well, standing in the front row and gazing into the blackness that exuded the smell of burning. A dragon appeared from the hole, a murmur ran among the knights, whether this was the same dragon they had held back earlier. All because the dragon suddenly grew in size, for some horrible reason its power increased. Yulderen didn't want to let panic set in. He gave a not-so-convincing smile and shouted that whatever the reason, it was nothing. The knight decided to set an example for his comrades and rushed to attack the beast, swinging his sword. Habark also began to conjure diligently. He was going to show everyone the level of magical power he could give out when he wasn't depleted by the many battles. With the support of the other mages, 
he used the cold frost technique, and a wall of icy coldness raced towards the dragon. Two more mages conjured the teeth of the earth and the spear of the earth, which spawned blade-sharp rocks that flew at the monster like projectiles. The dragon, on the other hand, was focused on the knights in front of him, seemingly still deciding whether to stomp them, burn them, or tear them with his teeth. Zeno admired the tactics of the knights and mages, and Shihan agreed with him, assuming that intervention wouldn't even be necessary. But as usual, at exactly that moment, everything went wrong, and Shu Han saw his words turn out to be a mistake. Ribbons of green glow curled around the dragon, and the powerful magic attacks directed at it dissolved without a trace. The mages seeing this lost their composure and their spells began to fade from loss of concentration. It wasn't that the dragon withstood the blow, it was that the blow was simply gone. This had only happened before when fighting creatures summoned from other worlds. The dragon that hadn't attacked before, as if wanting to demonstrate its invulnerability, now released a jet of flame. It was filled with red-hot cobblestones that crashed into the ground like meteorites, causing immense destruction. The ground caught fire from that breath, the flames spreading dozens of meters. The knights were engulfed in flames, as were the mages. Only one was able to dodge and dash away. Julderan was able to shield himself from the fire whirlwind, but his two less powerful comrades lay unconscious. With one blow, the dragon had nearly stripped them of all their combat potential. Yulderen thought feverishly about what to do next. The three knights were still standing in position, simply because that's what knights are supposed to do, but there had to be a drastic change of plan. Shehan, Zenon, and Alida were covering the panicked Keltron from the flames. They too realized they had to rush to help. Shahan felt the heat and realized with horror that just like that electric wolf, the dragon was capable of harming him. This thought was hard to get used to. The guy looked around the battlefield for people still fighting. Two knights and four mages lay unconscious. The remaining mage was useless against the monster. All they had were the three knights that the dragon was now pummeling with its paws, hitting only the shield so far. Shehan realized that there was no choice left but to give his best, even if it led to being found out. His sword once again shone with blue light, heralding the imminent release of powerful magical energy. Shi Han rushed to the rescue. As he approached the dragon, a whirlwind of blue sparks was already swirling around it, ribbons of lights flying in spherical waves in different directions. Alita watched mesmerized and quietly whispered Shi Han's name. Zanin was also watching without looking away, and the sight terrified him. He recognized the rituals, for in his years of worshipping the Savior, Zeno had become well-versed in the details of his fighting skills. The tornado swirled around Shihan faster and faster, the two swords in his hands writing out an intricate knitting, weaving patterns of light. Snapping out of his seat, he forcefully flew forward with magic. It was a heaven-conquering technique. The dragon had already looked away from the knights trying to somehow cover their wounded and was also watching this new creature exuding so much power. Flying towards the dragon's head, Shihan swung his sword, but it wasn't the weapon that struck, but a huge blade of pure light that stabbed into the dragon's cheek. The knights, awed as they watched the simple mercenary Sean single-handedly challenge a monster their entire group could not handle. Alita also add as the light blade struck the dragon, Zenon had told her, about the technique that Shihan had created to defeat the Emperor's monsters. Shihan, on the other hand, maintained his sternness. In fact, inside he was displeased and continued to make sword swings. It made him angry that he couldn't slay the dragon with a single blow. It was because the amount of available energy was still low. The only thing left to do was to keep striking, which Shihan did so fast that the dragon froze, engulfed by the storm pressing down on it from all sides. The knights chatted mesmerized. They could not believe their eyes and wondered who this man could be. Julderan admitted to his comrades that there was one thing they knew for sure. Shahan, who looked like just an experienced and talented swordsman before, was secretly much stronger than the knights themselves. Zenon and Alita decided that Shihan might need their help and rushed forward, leaving the useless Keltron behind. 
The one was brutally frightened at being left unguarded, but the sight distracted even him from his fear. He wasn't a boy for a long time, and so he knew and remembered many things. He recognized the battle techniques that were now being used against the dragon. The dragon was angry. So much damage had not been dealt to it yet. He spun on the spot and whipped his tail on the ground so that sharp splinters flew out of the rock, flying at the men. Xenon and Alita, who were already running towards the battle scene, were forced to slow down and take cover from the rockfall. Shahan shouted that the dragon was clearly not amiss. Now magic danced on his swords with blue flames. Meanwhile, the dragon wasted no time. Fire swirled in its mouth, bursting out between its teeth. The creature launched a jet of flame at Shihan, hovering nearby in the air. It was impossible to dodge at such a close range. One of the knights shouted to Shihan to save himself because the dragon was using all its power to attack. A stream of flames engulfed Shihan, pushing him higher into the sky with its pressure. For a moment, Shihan remembered how the wolf had managed to electrocute him. If his talent didn't work even now, this jet of fire would end his life. He strengthened his heaven-conquering technique again, guiding himself downwards towards the fire. And flying closer, he used the rumble of the mountains, and its onslaught split the previously dense stream of fire, scattering it in different directions. Alita and Zenin were illuminated by the sparks of bursting flames, the guy was in awe of Shihan's might, and the girl was simply marveling. And Shihan finally used another technique, dragon sword energy, and his swords entangled spirals of blue lightning. Shihan landed on the dragon's head and thrust those swords straight through its scales and skull deep down. And then the thousand explosions technique struck its final blow, a column of discharges growing on the dragon's forehead, scattering everything in all directions blood rushed from the dragon's mouth, eyes and ears, and it staggered and collapsed on its side with a soundless cry. A sense of powerlessness from facing a superior power seemed to be written on the monster's muzzle, its body sprawled on the ground. Shahan lowered himself onto the back of the defeated monster. He had suffered a lot in this battle, but he had done well. There was silence among the people. The female knight apprentices silently put their hands to their mouths open in astonishment and came to their senses. The experienced mages were just as amazed. Everyone just stood there waiting for something. Sheehan looked around the battlefield crushingly. He was certain that his cover had come to an abrupt end. Habark was the first to raise his voice. He started to speak but stammered. Finally, he told Sheehan that he fought magnificently and that to slay a dragon alone was something incredible. Shihan was surprised that this was the first thing he was told, after all. For a savior, killing a dragon could be considered routine. The knights approached and began to praise his fighting abilities. They were admired like boys. Shihan began to suspect that no one understood anything. The savior was so forgotten that even such a blatant display of fighting style didn't make them recognize him. Shihan didn't even know whether to be happy or sad at such a blow to his ego. Either way, he was glad the men had survived. He staggered onward, and Yaldarin stepped in front of him. He looked stern, and it was clear that he wanted an explanation from Shihan. Jolderin stated that Shihan had withheld his true skill level, and that his skills were on par or even superior to the Black Lion Knights. The commander of the knights asked what was the reason for the stealth and the purpose of portraying an ordinary mercenary. Xenon ran up and apologized and said that Shihan had been training in goals for a long time, but had no combat experience, so he started from the bottom to gain it. Zeno asked, understanding that it was normal for mercenaries to not blabber about their abilities, and the knights shifted their gaze from one guy to the other. It was a surprise to them that Xenon, who was rugged and manly with a weathered face and scars, was younger than Shihan with his well-groomed appearance. Jolderin said that explained why Zeno, with the rank of knight, was so courteous to the sword warrior, knowing of his talents. Zeno confirmed that defeating the dragon was nothing more than a combination of honed skills and a lot of luck, and Shihan played dumb. Nevertheless, Jolderin made a small bow, paying homage to such powerful talents the knight was glad to have met these people. He promised that he would definitely reward Shihan and his friends, and then headed off to the others to help the wounded and collect the dead. 
Shai Han exhaled a sigh of relief and thanked Zenon, whose cunning had once again helped him in a difficult situation. Zono replied that he couldn't let the cover that took so much effort die, especially since he had to limit himself in the fight with the dragon as well. Shihan smiled ridiculously. Alita had just approached them. She had heard the last words. She asked Shihan in a whisper if Zenon knew about losing her power, to which the guy replied that after betraying her friends, she wouldn't blabber either. When the danger had passed, Shihan's bravado returned to him, and he said that although he had taken the risk of using his style, no one would recognize him. Alita pointed her finger to the side and asked if Shihan was sure that this person didn't understand anything either. There, standing apart from everyone else, was Keltrin. Alita noticed that despite his vices, he was quite observant. Keltrin had his usual frightened look on one side, but there was some understanding in his gaze as he looked at Shihan. Shihan thought it was becoming Alita's bad tradition to debunk his words, but it was much worse if Keltrin really did understand everything. After a short time, their squad constructed a stretcher for their fallen comrades and were able to head back to the village. Only the dragon remained lying on the battlefield. When the squad returned, grief awaited Dina. As her mentor was among the casualties of the battle, she cried and begged him in vain to wake up. Another knight was also severely wounded, and four mages were killed by that fateful volley of fire. Later, Lacran's body was found in the cave and he and the dragon were burned with magical fire to finally erase the traces. Shahan continued to investigate the phenomena he didn't understand. He pondered that some monsters disappeared after death and some didn't. One of the wolves disappeared and the other remained, and it was unclear what the difference was or the reason for the disappearance. All the survivors of the trek spent the night in an empty cultist village to make the return journey in the morning. As darkness fell, there was a knock at the door of the room where Keltrin slept. The aristocrat was naturally startled. Shahan was outside the door and he said with a sinister smile that they needed to talk. Keltrin stood in the doorway, reluctant to let the visitor in, and tried to think of a plausible excuse. He said that of course they could talk, but what a question had arisen at such a late hour, and it might be better to rest before tomorrow's journey. Shihan realized that his interlocutor was being humorous and decided to press harder. He pretended, deliberately loudly, to ask Keltrin which savior from the other world he was talking about. Keltrin was sweating, he realized that he had been figured out and that it was best not to be sly. Shihan smiled gloatingly and said openly, Keltrin's reaction best confirmed that he understood everything. A moment later, they were ensconced in a corner of Keltrin's bedroom, which was poor but nice and clean, the aristocrat wondering if his hunch was true. They sat at the table, and Shihan answered in the affirmative, wondering how Keltrin was able to figure it out without even being a swordsman. Keltrin replied that ten years ago, they had crossed paths in person a few times, but he doubted it since Shihan's energy level was lower now. He asked why Shihan had arrived secretly and was hiding his identity. Keltrin thought of the six emperors who should be the first to know of an old friend's arrival. Hardly an attempt to avoid annoying fans, the level of secrecy is much higher. It meant that Shihan was wary of something or someone in Terranor. Keltrin suddenly uttered the phrase enemies in Terranor that ended his musings. Shihan's eyes widened. The boy wondered what enemies Keltrin was talking about. The aristocrat hesitantly began to say that after Shihan returned home, there were rumors that he was forced out. Most did not believe it. It was thought to be a tall tale, for to betray the savior would have been a great folly. Keltrin said he remembered it when he put it together in his head now, and Shihan thought that Keltrin was suddenly perceptive. He was able to collate all the little details and describe the events that took place. Shihan even wondered if Keltrin had been fairly attributed the insulting characterization about the animal mind. He wondered what Keltrin would do if the rumors were true. Keltron fidgeted. He didn't have a prepared answer for this, and he couldn't quite figure out what words Shihan wanted to hear. He tried to reassure himself that Shihan and Jackson Guard were friends, so he shouldn't be in any danger. But then he realized that if Shihan intended revenge, Jackson Guard was one of the targets and Keltrin realized that calm was premature. Finally, 
Keltron wondered why Shehan hadn't started his revenge yet. Would he not have the strength to deal with six emperors? And then the thought struck him that if Shehan really wasn't ready to retaliate openly, he might not feel sorry for Keltron so he wouldn't take any chances. The aristocrat threw himself on his knees and started begging Shihan for mercy. The guy didn't even immediately catch on to what had happened. Keltron bowed and wailed about his sick old mother and the three-year-old child who would be orphaned without him. Shihan thought, what child could we be talking about if Keltron wasn't married, and that the animal mind was now showing its full strength? The meaning of the nickname was that Keltron would lose his head at any little danger and his clear mind would be useless. Sheehan realized why Keltron hadn't caught his eye when the fight against Lustlanad was going on ten years ago. The guy tried to calm his interlocutor down, assuring him that he wasn't going to kill him, and he wasn't in any danger now either. Keltron let a tear fall and was grateful. He promised to be helpful and not tell Jackson Guard anything. Sheehan replied that it's not that simple because he can't just take Keltron's word for it. Jets of magic swirled in Shihan's hand like blue smoke. Keltron babbled, trying to ask what it meant. Shihan moved his hand lightning fast into Keltron's chest so that a blue flash passed through him and flew out from his back. Keltron didn't have time to be startled. He reflexively grabbed his chest, but it didn't hurt, and he only asked what Shihan had done. The guy sternly replied that it was the explosive aura technique blue lights were still popping off his hand. Keltron had heard about the explosive aura. At first, he was horrified. About this technique, it was told that the Savior placed inside a person a part of the magical energy connected with him and could cause an explosion at any moment. Shihan said that although this skill could only work with three people at a time and they didn't have to be swordsmen, it was extremely useful. He said that Keltron's life was now in his power, and he would only break the spell when he could trust the Count. Keltron, discouraged, sat on the floor holding his chest and remained silent. Then he exhaled a sigh of relief as if a stone had fallen from his shoulders. He smiled and told himself he was alive. Sheehan at first thought that Keltron wasn't afraid of his explosive aura for some reason, so carefree did his reaction look. He reminded him that if Keltron betrayed him, he would die an agonizing death. But the Earl replied that he wasn't afraid because he wasn't going to betray either. The only thing he's in danger of doing is if something makes Shihan think that Keltron is a traitor, and then the punishment would be undeserved. The Count declared that he was henceforth Shihan's obedient servant and was willing to do any of his bidding. The guy was shocked at such a quick decision. He asked if Keltron had no qualms or qualms of conscience about abdicating the Emperor in his favor. To this, Keltron only replied that one cannot hesitate in choosing between the Savior and the Destroyer of the Earth. Keltron looked calm and his words sounded sincere. It seemed the Savior's authority was indeed high for him. When Shahan left the house, it was already dark night. The moon was not shining, and in the light of the stars, he walked through the garden. Walking out of the courtyard, he passed through the wooden wicket. Shihan searched for someone with his eyes. Here behind the trees, Alita was waiting for him, noting that she could see that the conversation had gone well. Sheehan thanked her for her help. Alita had been standing guard the whole time and should have alerted if there were any intruders nearby. Alita seemed to be peeking, she said with admiration, that despite the low amount of energy Sheehan was able to use the explosive aura, Sheehan waved it away and said that this skill simply did not exist in reality. The guy replied that it would be too cool even for him to be able to blow people up remotely, so it was just intimidation. Alita indignantly said that even the books had written about this skill, to which Shihan replied that this was the calculation. Alita stood pouting as if she had been laughed at, stretching the prank out for a decade, and Shihan said they now had a big trump card, but he was still plagued by questions about the origins of the dragon and the igneous wolf, who had qualities as if they were summoned from another world. He assumed that these beasts were the experimental animals in the Blue Tower. Alita said she too is plagued by thoughts because of what's happening on this hike. When they attended the interrogation and Habark used the mysterious black powder, something happened. Shihan said that he had no idea what this powder could be, 
or what kind of magic was involved. Alita shook her head and said that she actually wanted to tell her something. When the powder was applied, it felt like there were dozens of insects crawling around inside her, and it was horrible. Her gaze was full of sadness from this memory. Sheehan didn't interrupt her, but the girl remained silent. Looking up at the starry sky, she said she didn't know how to explain it. Something about that powder in the mage's hand evoked vague memories or visions. A dark-haired mage in a red robe holding a powder and the figures of prisoners bowed before him. It all brought tears to her eyes. The emaciated woman was chained to the wall, a dark figure standing in front of her with a sword from which blood dripped. Lilstein motioned for the next man to come forward. Something glowing in the mage's hand. Another prisoner appeared, overgrown, bearded, and dirty. Lilstein, clutching the glowing black powder, commanded the man to kill himself. The bearded man grabbed his sword and brought it up to his neck, bracing himself for the move that would cut his life short, the prisoner's eyes a shroud. But the sword trembled in his hands. The prisoner couldn't do it. There was a palpable struggle going on inside him. The bearded man woke up. He did not understand where he was and what was happening. Fear was red in his already alive eyes. He realized himself with a sword at his throat, standing in front of a woman chained to the wall. All the man could do was whisper a few words to the woman. He called her dear and asked what he had done. Blood splattered, adding a fresh stain to an already crimson-stained floor. An angry Lilstein stood over the bearded man's body, his test subjects continuing to resist some of his orders, though the powder could not be made any better. The mage snapped his fingers. The chamber needed to be cleared for further experimentation, and magic was the quickest way to do it. The dead body caught fire, the magical flames quickly turning the remains into ash that flew away through the ventilation passages. Lilstein realized that getting the result he was aiming for was much more difficult than it seemed at the beginning. Jackson Guard's palace was a far cry from the gloomy dungeons, both in terms of distance and the atmosphere that prevailed there. The Emperor listened to the account of the results of the campaign and reacted very vividly when Jackson Guard was told about the dragon. He perked up. Keltron told him that two knights had died from wounds received in the battle, but overall the campaign had fully accomplished its objectives. Keltron didn't mention a word about the fact that the dragon wasn't simple and had something to do with the Blue Tower, the monster looked quite organic among the cultists. But Jackson Guard was still thinking dragon. He was hurt that he couldn't defeat the monster personally, and he loudly regretted listening to Keltron. The Count apologized, but realizing that what he had done could not be changed, Jackson Guard forgave his beloved subordinate. The captain of the knights asked Yulderan what the rumors were about the fighters who had played a special role in the battle. Julderan replied that there were indeed such, and their skill was so high that he wished to invite them into the order. However, these fighters were hired by Count Keltron as his personal guards. The captain said he had hoped for a replenishment too, but contemptuously added that since these people were only interested in money, so be it. Keltron listened with an awkward smile as Julderan challenged the captain's opinion that Shihan and his friends were just mercantile mercenaries with no honor. After reporting in to the Emperor, Keltron returned to his lavish mansion, so pompous it could have been called a palace. But there was another report waiting for him here, already to Shihan. Keltron had made his lodging available to him. He was willing to do anything to keep himself alive. Separate quarters outside the palace were also provided for the trio, and they were officially enlisted with a salary. Shihan noticed that the fictitious service was so authentically forged that the three of them only had to kneel before the Count. Keltron felt uneasy. He said he wasn't ready for something like this, because even giving them orders in public already scared the hell out of him. However, despite his consternation, Keltron seemed to want to know something. In a trembling voice, he struck up a conversation from afar, trying to find out if Shihan's revenge included killing Yaxengard. Shihan was surprised that Keltron could have guessed that he would do such a thing. He even laughed, but laughter also made the cowardly Earl shudder. Keltron wanted clarity on what the future held for him. Shihan good-naturedly said that Yaxengard didn't deserve to die, 
even though he had trampled the trust earned in dozens of side-by-side -side battles. But after all, he had only sent Shihan home, though he could have done it piecemeal. Shihan confidently said that he had no plans to kill Jackson Guard, although his look at this moment was ominous. The ruins of the castle showed the swaying banners of the Laxlin family, the smoke of the past battle rising into the sky. The knights involved in the siege rejoiced. The castle of one of Lustlanad's closest relatives had fallen. A blonde-haired boy was sitting by a field fire, thinking about something with a regretful look. His face was exquisite. He looked more like a poet than a warrior. Then someone called out a guy named Saffron. Jackson Guard called out to his comrade to celebrate the victory with everyone else. Their army had taken another big step towards overthrowing tyranny. Saffron replied that their victory was undeserved and asked who was the owner of the castle. Jackson Guard replied that the castle belonged to Luslanad's half-brother, Prince Grass, if he wasn't confused, and joked that he was not happy when he died. Saffron said that Grass resented the betrayal. The emperor hadn't sent back up to his kinsmen, and if it hadn't been for that, things would be different now. Guy tried to explain to Jackson Guard that the emperor had killed a rival by rebel forces, and they found themselves as someone else's tool. Jackson Guard recognized that kinship was worthless in the face of lust for power, but they should rejoice in victory, for they needed it. Saffron said that Jackson Guard wasn't very far-sighted, to which the Bogater cheerfully replied that Saffron should have been less of a troublemaker. Saffron was frustrated by this lack of understanding and continued to stare sullenly in front of him. He tried to ask Jackson Guard if he was thinking about something, but he didn't have time to finish because his friend immediately said no. He didn't need to finish the question, as he thought everything Saffron was thinking about was far-fetched. Jackson Guard said it was Saffron's business to think, and his business was to swing his sword. Saffron smiled, even though Jackson Guard may turn everything into a silly joke, but he was a kind guy. The blonde-haired boy asked what Jackson Guard thought would happen after the fall of the Emperor, and he replied that there would be peace, of course. But Saffron said someone will have to be the new king, and I wonder who it will be. Jackson Guard confidently replied that it would definitely be Song Shahan because he is powerful and he's not going home. Saffron said it's a logical assumption, but there are complications with it. Because if so, would Shihan's allies agree to become his subordinates? Would they be able to keep his friendship? Jackson Guard felt uncomfortable at the question. Their friendship seemed to him something unshakable, independent of anything. And Saffron added that Gras, who had been Lustlanad's staunchest ally, had been betrayed and left headless. So Saffron wondered what would happen when they should already be sharing power. It seemed that this question, along with the smoke, began to hover over the ruins. Jackson Guard opened his eyes. He was lying on the ground covered in an unthick layer of hay. The Emperor could sleep on more than just feather beds. It was the training yard where Jackson Guard practiced his skills. He realized that Saffron and those long-ago events had appeared to him in a dream. Ten years had passed, but some moments resurfaced in his mind, whether he wanted them to or not. Jackson Guard sat down with his legs tucked under him. He realized he had not become a sage after years, but here he wanted to know the answer if he was on the right side. Just then, shouts reached the emperor. Someone was bursting through to him, pushing the servants away imperiously. There were no guards here, as the emperor was able to fend for himself, but this man posed a different threat. A young man with long hair and a rich suit ordered the servants away and said he would deal with Jackson Guard himself. Then he stormed into the courtyard, swinging open the double-leaf gate, his look expressing indignation. Jackson Guard wearily greeted the young man named Eines and asked him what was the matter. Eines brazenly asked why the construction of a new palace had begun at insane expense when there was plenty of room for concubines in the existing ones. Jackson Guard replied with a smile that the heating had broken in the Southern Flower Palace and that his kitties must live in luxury. Eines said that Jackson Guard was as arrogant as the former emperor. Even in hard times, he threw people on a useless construction site. The young man fell silent, and a hard expression froze on his face as he stared into Jackson Guard's face. The Emperor stopped smiling in a tone that allowed no objection. He said that Eines had gone too far. 
Despite his outward firmness, Eines was afraid, but the emperor said he would let him go this time. Jackson Guard turned to the young man and said that some things cannot be forgiven even to a son. The emperor demanded that his son repeat what he had just said and the young man stammered. He clenched his mouth stubbornly, but it was evident that he could hardly bear his father's gaze. Ains blurted out that the workers are overloaded, the work schedule is unbearable, and people are resentful and cursing Jackson Guard. The young man hissed that looking at it one could see no difference between the new orders and the tyranny of the former emperor. Jaxengard hated being compared to Luslanad, and it was as if those around him conspired to do it to spite him. He shouted angrily at his son that the sweat should be silenced at once, and that he had forgotten his place in speaking here, though he himself had not seen human grief in those days. The shout and the step forward made by his father startled Ein so much that he recoiled back. Jacksongard looked reproachfully at his son, who spat on the hall, unable to withstand the psychological onslaught. Already calmer, he told Eins to stop taking up his time and go his own way, the emperor's frowning face allowing no objection. Eins didn't dare raise his eyes up and face his father. He muttered that he was obliged to speak up and then apologized. Accompanied by the commanding gaze, the prince silently rose awkwardly to his feet, turned around, and walked away past the servants who were still bustling around. Jackson Guard huffed unhappily. He thought he had raised an underwilled son who couldn't even defend his opinion. What did he know, this youngster, when he wasn't even ten years old? The previous emperor had executed his parents, brothers, sisters, and even his beloved Jackson Guard. The only family member of the current emperor, and such a disappointment since he didn't even have the talent of a swordsman. Jackson Guard thought the prince was thin and frail of character, while he was an expert fighter at that age. He thought he had made a mistake somewhere in his upbringing, perhaps pampering his only son too much. Keltron had always been proud of his mansion and wanted its gleaming splendor to show everyone the true level of the Earl's influence and wealth. Compared to this mansion, the four-story house looked like a pitiful annex, but it was in this unremarkable building that Shihan and his friends had their quarters. Nevertheless, Keltron had not skimped on the interior decoration, moldings and paintings, chandeliers and candelabras, expensive furniture. Everything was filled with glamour. The trio looked around the house with great interest. They had never had to live like this before, and Shihan saw that the house had even constructed the secret passage he had asked for. Keltron was present nearby, and respectfully showed what was where, he explained that the house was built for the future. Keltron said he wasn't married yet, so he had prepared the house in advance, but his interlocutors didn't quite understand the logic. Sheehan sternly remarked that kidnapping was a very bad idea, but Keltron hastened to reply that he didn't mean that at all. He replied that the house was built as a hiding place in case he was accused of disloyalty and the family had to be hidden. Zeno, on the other hand, bragged that he put his house on the market and was able to sell it for much more than he bought it for. Shahan replied to him that the money should last for a long time, Keltron hurriedly reminded himself, hinting that he could help in money matters as well. He assured Shahan that he could ask for any help he wanted. All this time, he had only addressed the guy with the word, Sir. Shehan hadn't experienced such treatment in a long time and blurted out it looked like life was starting to get better. He and Alita went out for a walk in the front garden. Shehan said he was grateful for his friend's advice. It was Alita who suggested to Shehan that he should demand an official address from Keltron. It had the perfect effect. She said that when Shehan talks to her on a first-name basis, it shows that they are equals, while Keltron needs to show the exact opposite. Sheehan was puzzled as to why Alita had become so interested in the effectiveness of their influence on the Count. Alita looked away thoughtfully and said that she really didn't care much about the success of their plan before, but something was different now. Sheehan was curious and asked what the girl was talking about. The woman evasively replied that it was actually nothing important and asked whether to address Sheehan officially now for her and Zinan as well. The guy calmly replied that he wanted to keep a friendly tone, so he didn't want such a change in their communication. Alita seemed pleased with the recognition of her friend's status, 
She thanked Shi Han nicely. She then asked what was the purpose of him inviting her here. After all, it wasn't all for idle conversation. Shi Han remembered what he wanted to offer. He said that the girl could try to supplement her specialization and start studying magic besides martial arts. Shi Han said that the girl had an aptitude for magic and potential, since she had become his summoner, albeit unwittingly. Alita hesitated. She had always thought of herself as just a swordswoman, and training in magic was hardly available to her day. Supplementing martial techniques with magic attacks looked promising, but getting into the ivory tower with her origin was impossible. Shihan traditionally smiled coyly. He said that they didn't need any tower. The guy solemnly declared that he was not only a master swordsman with the rank of deity, but also a level nine mage with the rank of master. The breeze was ruffling the crowns of the fruit trees. Shihan was starting his next lesson, going to start with the basics. Alita hoped that this time the lesson would succeed. Shihan began the story of the three components of the magic ritual, which began with the language of runes that gathered magical energy. The second step was a spell that transformed energy into something concrete. Fire lit up in his hand. The final third step was the command that what had been created by the spell begin to take effect, and fire struck from his hand into the ground. Satisfied with his demonstration, Shi Han showed Alita the scorched grass and waited for her reaction. Not waiting, he tried to comfort her by telling her that with practice it was getting overcomplicated and started shooting fire from his hands into the area around him. He also added that even geniuses cannot memorize all the spells, so there is an indispensable tool in this case. Shihan held out an empty hand to Alita and she peered carefully into the palm but saw nothing. A ghostly book appeared out of thin air. It was a book of spells in which the mage could write down everything he needed from his memory, and the journey began with it. Alita replied that she had interacted with many mages, but had never seen such a book. Shahan replied that he showed it on purpose. Usually the book is invisible, but sorcerers extend their hands in front of them just to leaf through it. This pose even got its name handprint or somatica. Alita nodded understandingly. Shihan gloatingly remarked that this book had helped him pass many exams when he was in college. Alita marveled and asked if there was no magic on earth, and Shihan confirmed that there was. The girl noticed that Shihan continued to use magic at home, meaning everything works in the other world. It's just that it's not being used for some reason. Shihan said he never really thought about how this happened, but it's a really interesting topic. He assumed he felt his magic when passing through the portals, and the rest of the earthlings didn't have that chance. Alita said admiringly that this meant that on Earth, Shihan was even more great because he had no competitors at all. The guy was surprised at this enthusiasm of hers. She started asking unexpectedly many questions. Here, his friend uttered another one. She wanted to know how he had lived these ten years in his home world. Shahan froze after saying those words. He seemed to have withdrawn into himself. Alita even called his name again. The boy lowered his eyes down. He had a hard time starting to speak. He squeezed out the first word. In those moments, memories flew before his inner gaze, his hometown, high-rises, and monuments. Car traffic so dirty and noisy, but necessary to the city like blood to the body. Passers-by going about their business or idly hanging around the stores, one day they saw a very unusual sight. A completely naked guy lying on stone tiles in the middle of the square, unclear where he came from, some wondering who he was, others shaming him. Someone even complimented his physique, while someone else covered the other's eyes so he wouldn't stare at the obscenities. Sheehan was lying on the cold stone, and in front of his eyes still stood his friends and traitors at the same time. At the police station, even the officers were pointing their fingers at him, asking if he was the weirdo who was lying naked in the street. Shi Han was given a police uniform to cover himself. They had already determined his identity and were judging that his parents' divorce might have pushed him into a bender. The police officer demanded an explanation of where Shi Han had been and what he had been doing since he was reported missing. Shi Han stared blankly in front of him and only replied that he didn't know anything. In vain, the policeman tried to demand that he not lie. It looked like he was going to be interrogated with a bias. 
Then a blue light flashed in the policeman's eye and immediately went out, a look of understanding on his face. The officer said it looked like amnesia and instructed the guy to see a doctor. Shihan looked at his face and smiled. He had just successfully used magic, and that was encouraging, but he decided to keep it a secret and get out of the station as soon as possible. As the paperwork continued, evening was already approaching, and he didn't even know which precinct he was in. The police officers inexplicably obtained and issued him clothes. Shihan walked out of the station through the front doors. Here he looked up and realized where the clothes he was now wearing had come from. A car was parked in front of the entrance, with Shihan's father standing beside it. It looked like returning home was going to be as painful as possible. Shihan turned hopefully to his father, who stood there examining his found son with a disparaging gaze. They came home to an apartment on the upper floors of a rowdy high-rise in a bedroom community in Dijon City. His father reprimanded Shihan, asking him where he had been for seven years, but not expecting an answer, he reproached him again for not even going to school. Shihan looked at his father and saw that after all these years and turmoil, he was still the same as he had been, a squabbling man, always grousing about his honorable name. Father kept harping on about the shame he had allowed in Kwang Hwamun Square, that it had already become the laughing stock of the entire internet. Shihan didn't expect warmth or sympathy, but even so, the reception was too cold. The boy looked around with pleasure. He had managed to miss his homeworld, which seemed faded after Terranor. He realized he missed the internet, the TV and air conditioning and appliances, but not his home. His father was his eternal overseer, ruthlessly looking down from above through his glasses, like a mask hiding everything human. His father said he would send his son to a special school in the capital so that Shihan would catch up with the curriculum and have a chance to go to college. This was supposedly necessary for Shihan to turn into a decent person. The guy obediently agreed and got up to leave. His father shouted at his back that if he failed to enroll, Shihan had better disappear again for many years. The guy tried to drown out those words in his head. He didn't want to believe they were even spoken. So many years he spent to free another world from tyranny, and as a reward, he got this, indifference and contempt. Shihan had a fire burning inside. He was eager to find a way to return at any cost. It wasn't supposed to end like this. His hatred for the traitors would become his fuel that would drive him to his goal. He would hold them accountable. Day after day dragged on. Warm days changed to cold days, clear days to cloudy days. For a year, Shehan tried to live the life of a schoolboy and yet find his way back. He attended a special school, but he put all his efforts not into lessons, but into mastering the deepest aspects of magic. His spellbook kept many entries with complex spells and also gave him the ability to pass the entrance exams easily. Even his father had become less rigid. It seemed that the worry about their family's reputation was not as strong now. But Shahan didn't care. Once he entered university, he wasn't going to live with his father anymore. Suho Shihan told his father that he didn't have to worry about him. He was capable of taking care of himself. The father was furious. The offspring had managed to screw it up even here, the one moment when everything went right. He threatened that Shihan might not even think of coming to ask for help afterward. But his son had already left the house without even looking back. Shahan resented how neglected he was, how they didn't believe in his strength, and yet he was now worth so much more. He was unique. He could turn his world upside down because he wielded a power that no one could oppose. With ease, Shihan got some money to live on and settled into a decent apartment. He would bet on races and help the right horse win by channeling his fighting energy into it. A year of magic tricks, and Shihan could no longer think about money while looking out of his apartment at the city through a floor-to-ceiling window. During this time, Shihan had managed to learn how to open portals to other dimensions, but these portals were uncontrollable. These portals led to unknown places, and he couldn't get anywhere he wanted to go, and going at random was akin to flying through space. Even if he traveled on, opening more and more windows, he might never find Terranor among the myriad realities. Shihan was wandering in the darkness of the unknown. Nothing more could be gleaned from the records. 
and personal experiments were inconclusive. The search for Terranor could take ten years, or it could take a lifetime. The urge to return was starting to get rusty. He wondered if he should have hated his former friends so much. After all, they had only brought him back home. He gradually began to justify them, to think that things hadn't turned out so badly given his current situation. Shihan decided that he forgave them, forgave his friends, forgave Lavina. After all, relationships with girls are always fickle. He accepted the thought that it would be impossible to return. That thought, like a drop that made all the liquid pour out after it, robbed him of the strength to resist. For seven years after that, he tried to live a normal life and find his place in his native world. After all, he went to university. He had made friends among his classmates, but now he shunned close relationships, so he led a loner's lifestyle. Following university, Shihan served in the army, which made him even forget the terrible pages of life in Terranor, replacing them with new ones. From time to time, Shihan would think that if he had magic, he could make his world a better place, but how Terranor had repaid him for such an endeavor. His home world was teeming with life. He lived in a beautiful city, but he was miserable, and no amount of business could make things right. One day in training, there was a moment of truth. He felt it, and he didn't even immediately realize what, but he knew it was more important than anything else in the world. Stepping on the treadmill, he listened to the sensations like a hunting dog sniffing around after finding a trail. Out of habit, Shihan was going through the directions to open the portal, and somewhere among the many realities, something familiar sounded. Had he tapped into Terranor's magical energy, he couldn't believe it. But he tried to replay that direction over and over again so he wouldn't forget. Shahan jumped to the floor and rushed away from the unnecessary witnesses, breaking his head. Everything else didn't matter. He ran out of the hall, wondering how he'd managed it. Why now? Shihan ran down the street as hard as he could. It was an agonizingly long way home. He was so eager to experience what he had just fumbled. He ran and smiled. For the first time in years, he was overwhelmed with joy, as if the colors had returned to the world. He had a chance to make things right, a chance to return to Terranor again. Until now, Shihan wasn't able to do so because he didn't know in which direction the portal needed to be opened to get to Terranor specifically. But now the key had been found, in the darkness of the infinite universe, where the swarm of dimensions is incomprehensible to man, a guiding ray of light was lit. It was the light of Terranor that Shihan could no longer lose. That was as if it was asking for a door to be opened into it. Shihan kept running. Passersby looked back at him, but he didn't care about them. The question crossed his mind as to why he was so excited, why he was so eager to check it out, if he had long since resigned himself, decided to stay on Earth. The certainty that he had forgiven everyone that the drama of returning was entirely in the past, was blurring. It was never true. All this time he had lied to himself because he was crushed by the impossibility of returning. All these years the bitterness of disappointment had made him miserable. The anger now woke up in Shahan and was directed at himself. He cursed himself for folding his arms. All previous beliefs crumbled. He knew he would grab this chance and do whatever it took to reach his goal. Shihan dropped out of university, spending all his time in training. He mastered the art of opening portals and practiced martial abilities. The thought that everything was within his power energized Shihan, and there was no trace of his former apathy. Finally, ten years after returning to Earth, the portal to Terranor was opened again. Shihan stood in front of it and couldn't believe it. It succeeded him, something forbidden, but what awaited him on the other side? No one knew. Shihan started laughing. It didn't matter if he succeeded. What did it matter what happened next if he had fulfilled a deepest wish? He laughed and welcomed the door to another world. It was a hero's triumph. Now Shahan is left to set things straight and return what is owed to the Savior from the other world. The guy woke up and finished the sentence he started to say to Alita, replying that it was pretty good. He added that he could use magic and combat energy, was able to settle into society his problems he chose not to make light of. Alita seemed pleased with this answer and quite interested. She had a dreamy look in her eyes. 
Shahan puzzledly tried to guess what his friend was thinking. They started the class. It seemed that teaching magic to Shihan was a bit better. The day for the class was also chosen perfectly. Alita sat on her knees, focused on something inside herself, her hands clenched into fists. Shihan asked her how she felt, to which she replied that there was some indefinable feeling. The guy admonished that knowing the theory you can't start until you get a feel for what you're going to run. He decided to cheer her up and told her that she would be able to open portals after already reaching the third level of mastery. Alita even opened her eyes in amazement. She queried if such serious magic was only available at the third level, and Shihan simply confirmed, for she had already summoned it. After summoning, she would learn how to hide the magical traces the summoner left behind. That wasn't hard either. She can said that when she learned to do this, she would no longer need him to disappear from the sight of her pursuers. Alita realized that she would gain complete freedom with not much effort. Shahan jokingly added that he would certainly ask her not to risk herself until he finished his business. Alita was excited. She got up from the ground and timidly began to speak. She asked if Shihan wanted her to stay with him on the team and help him achieve his goals. The guy replied that he would certainly be happy about it, as he trusted his friend, and she had helped him out more than once. Alita hesitated before her next question. So far, Shihan's answers had suited her. She asked what his plans were after the revenge was complete, where he was going to go and what he was going to do. More specifically, she wanted to know if Shihan wanted to stay in Terranor like he did ten years ago. Her friend replied that Terranor had managed to change a lot and now he didn't even know what to do. It was like he had become a stranger in both worlds. Shahan assumed that when he executed his plan, he would think about where to go next. He'll probably go home voluntarily this time, as he really has incredible prospects in his homeworld. Alita turned to her friend with fear, some horrible thought gripping her. She asked if it would take burning someone's heart to return, causing Shehan to jump up and object strongly. He replied that going home would be easier for him than getting to Terranor. He twirled his finger, and a blue discharge flashed. A small portal opened in the air in front of him. Alita stunned in surprise. Sheehan said that if he opens a random portal from an alien world, it always leads to Earth, and only on Earth do portals lead anywhere. The only thing is that he doesn't know where exactly on Earth he'll end up, and then Kwang Huaman Square rose before his eyes again. But even that was taken care of, so there would be no repeat of the past disgrace, Shehan declared, and Alita thought he was being morbid. The girl smiled she was about to say or ask something important. The swordswoman declared to Shahan that she would go to Earth with him. The guy didn't expect her to be so eager. She explained that here she was an eternal exile, the daughter of a tyrant and an object of prey, but there she would have a chance for a fresh start. Shihan looked at her and thought that there was a great deal of truth in those words. Alita said that she would help Shihan in his business, and in return she asks for a chance to go to Earth for herself. The girl uttered the request so passionately that Shihan trembled in front of her sincerity and beauty. He wouldn't be able to refuse her. It was idyllic in yet another of Jackson Guard's palaces. Brightly colored birds making melodious trills as they perched in the thickets of flowers framing the elegant fountains. A young woman of beautiful appearance was strolling through the park. Her blonde hair was braided into a thick braid that fell over a blue dress. Someone called out to her from behind and wondered if she was walking all alone. It was Prince Eines, and he greeted Queen Layla complacently. Layla was happy to see him, too. Her aquamarine eyes were the pattern from which the fabric for the dress was chosen. The woman radiated pure gentleness. She replied that even alone it was nice to walk under such a beautiful sky, but Eines added that it was also dangerous. Layla replied that she had nothing to fear as she had only one word from the queen, and in fact she played no role in politics. Jackson Guard had married her for convenience, and after the wedding he had not dignified her with attention. She was not privy to palace affairs. Layla turned and staggered onward, but turned around when Eins spoke again. He said he was quite interested in her, unlike her father, and hugged her from the back, pulling her close to him. Layla gently objected that that was impossible and that they shouldn't be seen. 
but she offered no resistance, allowing herself to be hugged further. Heinz replied that that was why he was talking about walking alone, because he had checked the park and there was definitely no one else in it. The prince began kissing the queen, and she let him continue, melting into his embrace. The queen's palace was distinguished by its blue trim. It was a color that distinguished things pertaining to her. After a while, Eines was walking down one of the corridors. He was walking with a normal gait, but you could see his wariness from the front. Finally, he pronounced for the man who had been following at his heels to stop hiding and reveal himself. Count Keltron appeared from behind a pillar and Eines bluntly asked what kind of stakeout he had arranged. Keltron stepped closer and replied in a conspiratorial tone that he had some very interesting information for Eins. Shahan grudgingly put a large pill in his mouth. This procedure always caused difficulties. The remedy was unpalatable, with a strong bitterness. Even though you just had to swallow it, it managed to leave a mark. Zeno appeared beside a vial. He presented it to Shi Han, saying that it was a sauce he had made on purpose to make it easier to take the remedy. While Shihan was praising Xenon because the sauce really made the taste palatable, Alita thought that she had literally felt the effects in one day. They were special pills that increased combat energy and were used specifically for training. They now had a large supply of the remedy, thanks to Earl Keltron, with his money and connections. Shihan was very satisfied. Under the new circumstances, his strength was growing by leaps and bounds. He had already reached the master level. This speed of recovery made the fight with Jackson Guard increasingly close. He could already see his opponent in front of him and anticipated the sweet payback. But Keltron and Sheehan's interactions were turning upside down once they met at the Count's mansion. The maid reported the arrival of the mercenary Sean. Shakan stood in the doorway and peered through the ajar door. Keltron erupted in indignation and began to reprimand Shu Han for being late, which was unacceptable. He demanded of him to stop delaying and come in, and ordered the maids to get out. They, frightened at their master's anger, immediately fled. Sheehan looked at the closing door in surprise, and Keltron exhaled tensely. The Earl immediately rushed to beat bows to his secret lord. He seemed to be uncomfortable with playing out such scenes. Sheehan watched this performance and thought what a striking change had occurred in the blink of an eye. He said Earl plays it perfectly and it's impossible to know from the outside when he's not faking it. Keltron said he's only maintaining a cover. Sheehan actually wanted to see the Count himself. He asked how the status of his request was. Keltron pulled out a list from a hiding place and showed the list with a number of names that Sheehan had asked for. These are people who, according to Keltron's information, are not particularly loyal to the current government and would be willing to support a coup. He suggested that if he openly fought Yaxengard, Shahan would most likely succeed, but the other five emperors would immediately unite. If the operation is done covertly, as if the citizens themselves overthrew their ruler, it will not arouse anyone's suspicion. Shaihan marveled at how quickly Keltron had disowned the one he served, but he cared that the list wasn't very long, there weren't many disgruntled people. In doing so, Jaxengard relied on an army the Order of the Black Lion, and a militia of 30,000 infantry made up a large force. Of course, Shahan already knew that some of the knights had their own interest since they conducted their operations on the Order of the Blue Tower without anyone's knowledge. Shahan said they needed to deal with the part of the elite that made up the loyal backbone of Jackson Guard's power and asked who was leading them. Keltron raised his hand with a satisfied look and said that figure was him. Shi Han saw the plan as risky, he liked it, but something was missing. It was only necessary to decide how to get rid of some of the difficulties and dangers. Keltron said there was one thing bothering him. Shi Han listened as the Count was more versed in intrigue. Keltron said that Prince Eines, who they decided to bet on, doesn't bet him on anything, and without authority, it would be hard to convince him. They had a dialogue a few moments earlier. From the corridor, they moved to a closed room when Eines listened to the Count. He didn't believe he was a traitor. Keltron sat in his chair and expressed humility and sincerity with his whole appearance, but Eines thought it was fake and assumed it was another trick. He said that Keltron is too close to the Emperor, 
and has too much of him to overthrow him. Keltron couldn't say he had gotten a patron even more powerful, had to convince the prince by other means. But Ains didn't think Keltron's arguments about the country being in decline were worth anything to him, so he wanted to know the motive. Keltron decided to act differently, his expression turning sly to match what he would say. The Count agreed that he was just a parasite who used power for personal enrichment. And that is why he must see to it that this state is preserved, for it is in danger of ending if Jacksongard is not removed. Ains was disturbed by such a statement. He wanted to know what made Keltron think that. Prince stated that this kind of statement can't just be uttered, to which Keltron replied that he was willing to put his life on the line. The Count said he was looking out for himself first, but started the conversation with the poor, as a change in power would help them too. Keltron said he would even be willing to lose some of the wealth if he knew he would live a long life with it, instead of falling from the heights to the bottom. Eanes objected that Jacksongard was young and powerful, why would he lose power and country? Keltron said that Prince Eanes is smart, and therefore knows the answer to that question himself. The kingdom played a bad role in the Cargon War, so as soon as Lilstai or Anathias get a chance, they'll take this piece off the board. Alas, by sharing power, the six friends have not strengthened their friendship but destroyed it. So if one of them goes out, it will be safer. Keltron realized that if the power changed, he would have to play the concern for the people under the new ruler. But he wasn't used to it. Eines countered that if there was a coup, Keltron would still be in danger. The prince said he had no intention of encouraging this lying upstart if he got power. He suggested he would strip him of all his money. So he asked what then would be Keltron's benefit if he no longer had privileges. The Count closed his eyes. He was gathering all the convincing he had in him. He replied that he was maximally efficient in securing the result, whatever the king wanted. Good for the poor or personal wealth. Jackson Guard wished for luxury, and Keltron provided him with luxury. If the prince answered what he wished for, Keltron would fulfill that as well. Eines jumped up in anger. This cynical bribery was not to his liking, like making a deal with the devil for a good cause. Keltron decided he'd said enough and got up from the table as well. Remaining calm, the Earl staggered away while the prince continued to stand, holding back his anger. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed that the Count had stopped at the very door and never opened it. Keltron said that this woman was the queen. At those words, the prince's eyes widened, he wondered how this man knew everything. Keltron added that it was the king's woman, to be exact, and the prince stared fiercely at his back, ready to pounce. He asked Keltron what he was implying. Ains wanted to stop these damn games. Keltron turned around with a smile. He had found what he was looking for. Now the prince was ready to listen to him. The earl explained that the queen would not go to Yaxengard. It would go to the king, whoever became king. The Keltron mansion was idyllic at midday, with birds singing in the surrounding garden and a cool breeze blowing. After returning from the Count, Shihan settled down on the sofa to deepen his reading. He relished the opportunity to wander his eyes relaxedly over the lines. But rest was not destined to take place. A sudden rumbling and shouting was heard from the street. Shihan rushed downstairs and swung open the doors of the house leading to the garden, looking around to see what had happened. Alita was there, confused, guilty, and scared at the same time she could only call out to her friend for help. Zeno was lying on the ground, still covered in flames, looking like the knight had received a powerful blow. The friends called out to Zenon, hoping he would come to his senses, their cries echoing through the garden and frightening the birds. Shihan shook his comrade, hoping it would help him wake up. Alita stood guiltily to the side, though there was a twinge of admiration for herself in her. Shihan wanted to know how this happened, and the girl began to tell. Zeno tended the spinach in the vegetable garden. The beds of beautifully tidy bushes were a delight to the eye. Knight was enthusiastic about gardening. Soon he was already planning to harvest his crops. Alita had been practicing magic a little farther away. It had been about a month since she'd started doing it. She opened the spell book and decided to try to cast one for the first time to try it out. What Shihan was showing her seemed simple enough that it would succeed the first time. 
She began to repeat the necessary actions. A faint glow began to emanate from her hands, and streams of fire flowed from nowhere into her palms. Except that the result exceeded expectations, a wind blew from Alita, lifting leaves into the air. An entire whirlwind of fire fluttered in her hands, whipping jets of fire at the ground around her. The girl realized that she couldn't hold on to this magical blob. Zeno only had time to turn around wondering what was going on with Alita. She shouted to him cautiously, but the fire lashed out in his direction faster than the man could react. Luckily, the huge fireball didn't hit the guy, but it did hit his favorite beds. The explosion was so strong that Zeno was thrown back and fell to the ground unconscious. Alita said she tried to steer the fire away, but all she managed to do was offset the balloon's flight by a couple of meters. Zenon, who was already awake, was examining the dead beds and lamenting that it should have been him in their place. The guy didn't seem to be hurt. Alita was embarrassed and said that next time she would aim specifically at Zenon, to which Shihan remarked that it was okay to aim for the sky. He examined the impact site and concluded that it didn't look like first-level magic, then asked if Alita had actually used that spell. He asked her to try again to see for herself how it was happening. The girl was already a little afraid, but she began to concentrate her magic using the rune language again. Shahan watched in amazement as the magic gathered around her in a dense stream. He stopped her before she even started to cast the spell. Shihan was impressed by what was happening. It seemed like this wasn't what he expected at all when he offered to train her. He told her that the amount of magic she was concentrating was consistent with a fifth or even seventh level mage. Zeno asked in surprise how that was possible since she had just started, to which Shihan said that although it was hard to believe, it was. Alita asked for an explanation of what was happening to her and her sorcery. Shahan said that mages take energy from the surrounding nature, and when they create a spell, a fifth or even a tenth of that energy is left over. But when Alita does the same thing, the amount of energy doesn't just not decrease, it increases. It was only possible if there was some additional source adding energy. Shahan shook his head, admitting that he had never seen such a thing, and wondered if Lil Stai or Safran knew anything about it. Alita asked if she could then study further, to which the guy replied that the risks were very much increased and she should stop. The girl was upset by this and questioned if she had correctly realized that there was a very large power hidden within her. And if so, how could she ever give up that power if it could be used? Sheehan thought that Alita was a risky girl, he wanted to keep her safe, but she didn't seem to want to do it herself. Since that was the case, he had another solution for his girlfriend for this issue. Sheehan admitted that there was a second way in which she didn't need to stop practicing. He said he had once overcome a similar problem due to the fact that Earthlings absorb more energy from nature than Terranor residents. Alita rejoiced. Now she knew that overpowering magic was not a judgment. Sheehan said he would try to teach her how to control her excess energy, but that carries a lot of risks. Alita didn't hesitate to agree. Because once she had tasted magic, she wasn't ready to give it up. Count Keltrin's office was already becoming very familiar to Shi Han. He closed the door tightly behind him, taking his usual precautions. Servants were in the habit of prying. Keltrin radiated cordiality. He greeted Shi Han and invited him to take a seat across from him. Shi Han came to see how the negotiations with Ains were going. Keltrin replied that the prince had thawed somewhat and was looking at the plan with interest. But he's made counter conditions. He wants assurances of reliability, so it doesn't appear that Keltrin isn't serious. Shahan said that it was predictable, so he only wondered what kind of proof the prince wanted. Keltrin replied that Ainz wished to eliminate one of Jackson Guard's so-called three loyal dogs. The emperor had three confidants on whom he dumped the entire administration of the state. They ran the army, the economy, and politics. The army was led by Master Berkeley, the head of the Black Lion Order of Knights, whom Shihan had the chance to see. The emperor's father-in-law, the richest man in the country, Count Kramaton, was in charge of the economy. Shihong asked who was the last dog to determine the kingdom's politics. Keltrin raised his hand with a satisfied look and said that this figure was him. Shihan was seized by a fit of deja vu. Keltrin said it was Master Berkeley, 
a pillar of Jackson Guard's military strength, who was their target. Sheehan asked if that meant he was being asked to fight him, and Keltron expressed his confidence that Sheehan would defeat him with one left. Shahan was flattered by this, but since he had to get by without techniques that could give him away, the task was difficult and required more information. Keltron said Sheehan actually knows a lot about Berkeley. He was just misled by the fact that he changed his name to a new one. In fact, this man was known during the time of the former emperor as Darthwald, the first assault commander of the Yaxengard army. Somewhere far away from the capital was another construction that Yaxengard was so fond of. A fortress was being built to defend the frontiers. The ruthless guards kept pushing the workers to work faster. He went wild and threatened to kill someone else to incentivize the others. The workers only looked around sullenly. A sharp blow from a man who appeared nearby toppled the guard to the ground and knocked the air from his lungs. The man was armed. Such a clear display of disobedience could only mean one thing. This was a riot. The riot leader's face was disfigured by a scar. The workers let out an excited shout and began to gather around him. The guards grabbed their weapons. They were preparing for the most drastic action. The workers pulled out hidden weapons and a scuffle broke out. The confrontation was bloody. Master Berkeley was informed that a rebellion had broken out at the construction site. Berkeley shrugged and replied that the guards could deal with the blacks themselves. The messenger objected that there seemed to be a former knight among them, and that was why the guards were failing. Berkeley whispered contemptuously that the man seemed to have lost the remnants of honor. He stood up and strode toward the battle site, determined to deal with the traitor himself. The guards were falling under the knight's blows. Even now that he was no longer in uniform, he was still far more dangerous than them. The scarred man was cutting a path for Jackson Guard slaves to release them into the wild. He urged the guards to leave as he didn't want unnecessary casualties after all. Among them could be those he had once fought side by side with. Some of the guards did recognize him. Captain Delarte's name came up. He was a master swordsman, and the guards were no match for him. Then Delarte saw that there was someone among them who was not in a hurry to retreat to safety but was moving toward him. The guards saw Master Berkeley striding among them, heading towards the leader of the rebellion. The magister shouted to the guards, who had retreated in indecision in front of their former comrade-in-arms, to get back in formation and obey the emperor's orders. Coming within a few paces, Berkeley smiled and greeted Delarte, drawing his sword from its sheath. Delarte turned to the magister, he called him Darthwald, and a look of sadness spread across his face. The master said the name no longer applied to him and asked why Delart was here if he had become a farmer and retired. Delart replied that he was mistaken when he thought the battles were over, but the new order forced him to stand up again in defense of the oppressed as before. Berkeley mockingly shouted that Delart had ceased to be a knight. He was a farmer and farmers have no honor, but now he wanted to fall lower and become a traitor. Delarte clenched his teeth in anger. This man dared to still say something about betrayal. He shouted, What knightly honor is the magister ranting about here when people are dying from hard work for the sake of enriching the nobles? Berkeley replied that a knight's business was not to reason, but to obey his lord's orders and remain loyal at all costs. Delart asked Darthwald if this was what it took to overthrow the old emperor. The magistus flared up and drew his sword aside. He demanded that his old name no longer be spoken. Berkeley said that his having it was the one the emperor had given him, and snapping out of his seat, the magister pounced on his opponent. Delarte had not expected such a fierce attack. From the last, he believed that the old twin would not dare to do such a thing. Berkeley approached menacingly, his sword pointed toward Delarte, ready to collapse when the distance became sufficient. Their swords crossed, yellow discharges of martial energy dancing around them. Delarte immediately felt the might of his opponent. It was akin to having a rock pressing down on you. Despite the fact that they were of the same rank, Delarte already realized that he wouldn't be able to defeat the Master Knights. He stood in dumb defense while Berkeley showered him with a hail of punches, each one taking away his strength.